Thank you, Officer Jane May. Um, all right, there has been, Ms. Howen can come forward, please. If you're here for the regular docket, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to finish up this trial. We're getting ready to start final argument here in a few minutes. So the regular docket will convene approximately 11 o'clock or so. The court's instructions on the law are not very long, but it will take me a few minutes to read through those after the parties argue their case. Now, uh, did you copy Mr. Whalen with your request? The state's requesting that the court instruct on criminal responsibility. Is it the state's position that Ms. Howington is responsible for the, uh, under the criminal responsibility statute and pattern instruction for the actions of Callie or Gavin? Is that where? It could be both. The state has indicted for neglect, which results in serious bodily injury, i.e. death. So how is Gavin neglecting his sister? I'm not talking about the neglect count, Your Honor. I'm talking about the felony murder count. And whenever you look at the language of the felony murder count, it says the defendant or one for whom the defendant is criminally responsible unlawfully killed Destiny Oliver. And so whenever I'm talking about criminal responsibility, I'm talking about the person who pulls the trigger and literally shoots the child. I'm not talking about under neglect. I'm talking about the, the actual person pulling the trigger. Right, which, so, which version of criminal responsibility are you suggesting is so appropriate? I think, I think under the what the defense put forward and what the state's put no, forward in this case. The language out of the instruction. Which yes. of these are you saying fits that? Uh, I think the first one and the third one. I can't do both. Um, it's, it's error. The Supreme Court case says it's error for me to charge more than one. I can't charge all of them. So, Your um, the case that we have that we'd like for the court to look at is James uh, State versus James Lummox, and that talks about separate theories of guilt. And in that case, it says uh, unanimity. unanimity is never required more than a general verdict in a case where only one offense is at issue based on a single criminal occurrence. Where a jury is unanimous regarding a defendant's guilt on a single offense arising from a single occurrence, the presence of multiple theories poses no issue. And so I think that the, the court can in this case, given the litany of things that the defendant has said in this case, put forward more than one of those in the instructions. But your predicate felony is aggravated That's child neglect. That's absolutely correct, Your Honor. Which means that there has to be someone else responsible for the neglect. And the I'm result and the I'm, neglect. I'm talking about two different things, Your Honor. So whenever we're talking, I'm not asking for the court to talk about criminal responsibility with respect to the neglect in this case. But whenever- That's what you've been talking about. Your Honor, I'm talking about the felony murder count in this case. Felony murder has two elements. The first element is that the defendant or someone for whom the defendant is criminally responsible killed destiny. So for the first element, that's the only thing that I'm talking about here. I'm not talking it, about the it, second you, count where we get into ch aggravated child abuse. I'm talking about the first child I'm talking about the first element of this offense. General, I, I'm not I, you and I are just not communicating this morning. In order to prove felony murder, you have to prove the predicate felony, in this instance, aggravated child neglect, and that during the commission of that predicate felony, death resulted right. as a proximate result of the conduct, i.e. the bank robber goes in, and during the course of the bank robbery, somebody gets shot and killed. That's felony murder all day long. You don't have to prove that anybody intended to kill anybody. And that's the second element. Can we, can we pull up the projector so I can show the court what I'm talking about? It's, it's on. Had you indicted her for, in addition, for account for aggravated child neglect, you, had you indicted her for aggravated child abuse, I think you would have a much more compelling argument. Uh, but you are, just indicted her for the neglect. There are three elements to felony murder that the state has charged in this case. The first one, the first element, is that the defendant or 
one for whom the defendant is criminally responsible, unlawfully killed Destiny Oliver. That's the first element. That's the only thing I'm talking about. The second one, the killing was committed in the perpetration of or the attempt to perpetrate the alleged aggravated child neglect. That is, that the killing was closely connected to the alleged aggravated child neglect and was not a separate, distinct, and independent event. I think we're talking about two different things. I am asking for an instruction about criminal responsibility because of the first element that the state has to prove in that case, which is that Destiny Oliver was unlawfully killed. And 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 that's why we need this instruction. Like child yes, Your Honor. Yes. I'll just reiterate, you, you and I are not community. Let, let's, let me give you this hypothetical. Let, let's assume you had indicted Ms. Howington for aggravated child abuse in addition to aggravated child neglect. All right, the abuse, um, to prove aggravated child abuse, you would have to prove that the defendant, or one for whom the defendant is criminally responsible, um, knowingly abused, and I'm paraphrasing the language of the statute, knowingly abused a child less than eight years of age, which results in serious bodily injury or death. Well, obviously, if the proof doesn't support that Ms. Howington personally pulled the trigger, the argument would then be, well, ladies and gentlemen, she is criminally responsible for Callie or for, mm -hmm. if the facts support that, or for Gavin's actions, uh, which resulted in serious bodily injury and death. But you've indicted for neglect. You've indicted to say that she is criminally responsible, or excuse me, that, she, that her conduct, her negligent conduct, mm -hmm. resulted in the death of this child. But her negligent conduct can be... How is Gavin responsible for her negligent conduct? That's what I'm, I'm not, asking. I'm not saying that Gavin is responsible for her negligent conduct. When the court looks, Then how is criminal responsibility Because happened? when you look at criminal responsibility, it talks about somebody... Can, do you, I'm, give me just a second. Let me pull up the exact language. Do you know what TPI that is? 301. It says here, the defendant is criminally responsible for an offense committed by the conduct of another if, acting with the culpable culpability required for the offense, the defendant causes or aids an innocent or irresponsible party to engage in conduct prohibited by the definition of the offense. And had you indicted her for abuse, I would agree with you. You indicted her for neglect. Your Honor, it doesn't matter if it's abuse or neglect. That, that, that makes no difference at all to this analysis. The fact of the matter is, if Gavin is the one that pulled the trigger in this case, she is a per he is an innocent or irresponsible person, and she is responsible for his, his conduct and his behavior under this definition of criminal responsibility. She is if that's the conduct that is indicted. I don't know why we're not communicating on this, General. Do you want to weigh in on this? But I can only say that it has always a, a, appeared to me that what that is talking about is when acting in concert, which is what the felony statute, felony murder statute is about. This is like saying you and I go to rob the convenience store, I shoot the clerk, they charge the guy who's at home mowing my lawn. No, because what? he's crim I'm criminal. He's I'm criminally responsible. He's criminal responsible. For Here's an example. Let's assume a criminal defendant uh, encounters, uh, decides he wants to rob a bank. That criminal defendant uh, finds a person. Uh, well, let's just use, use a five-year-old child. Uh, finds him a five-year-old child, and he said, "Hey, we're going to have some fun. Um, you're going to walk into this bank, and I'm going to give you this. Uh, it's uh, a gun. It sure looks like a gun, and you get to carry this in." And when the, the five-year-old child carries a gun, he said, oh, by the way, I want you to hand this note to the teller, and then we're going to play another game. The second that teller gives you some money, I want you, I'm going to time you to see how fast you can run out of there. Then the government indicts uh, that defendant, assuming that he's caught, all of it's provable. The government indicts that defendant uh, for bank robbery. If the government then indicts that defendant for bank robbery, that 
part of the statute, the criminal responsibility statute, fits to a T. Had you indicted Ms. Howington for aggravated child abuse, I would be much more amenable to agreeing with you on this. But the conduct that she is being, the state is attempting to hold her culpable for is the neglect. That's what you've indicted her for. How do I get to there on criminal responsibility? Your Honor, are you saying that she can't be responsible for allowing her child to get the gun in this case? No, I'm not saying that at all. That's the neglectful conduct you have alleged in this case to get you to a jury to attempt to convict them. That's what this whole case is about. Where was the gun and how did that child get it? I'm going to read comment one from 3.01. The defendant is criminally responsible for an offense committed by the conduct of another if having a duty imposed by law or voluntarily undertaking to prevent commission of the offense and acting with the intent to benefit in the proceeds or result of the offense or to promote or assist its commission, the defendant fails to make a reasonable effort to prevent commission of the offense. And the next part, the defendant who is criminally responsible for an offense may be found guilty not only of that offense but also for any other offense or offenses committed by another if you find beyond a reasonable doubt that the other offense or offenses committed were the natural and probable consequence of the original offense for which the defendant is found criminally responsible. Natural and probable consequences rule doesn't apply. That's not even an issue here. But what is the conduct that under the language you just read, what is the conduct that you're saying that she is accountable for? For leaving her gun in a place where her young child has access to it. Exactly, i.e. neglect, correct? Which is what she's indicted for. And that's, again, Your Honor, I know that we're disagreeing right now on this point, but what I'm talking about is criminal responsibility for the first element. That's all I'm talking about. Do you have a case that says I can parse that first element out? Yes. State of Tennessee v. James Lemmix. Would the court like to see this? I don't think it's going to say that, Your Honor. I haven't read the whole case, General, but explain to me how this case changes the result at all. That Lomax case changed the result at all. You had people in a vehicle where the defendant was accused of driving the vehicle and the court gave an instruction on criminal responsibility for driving under the influence, correct? Which was the indicted charge. How is Gavin criminally responsible in this case for the neglect, which is what is indicted? I'm not saying that Gavin is criminally responsible. I'm saying that she is criminally responsible for Gavin's actions. Okay. How does criminal responsibility fit? How did Gavin commit 
uh, neglect. I, I don't think he did. It, it appears to be that I can't be responsible for someone else's criminal act if they are not acting criminally. That is the issue. How did he? I don't completely agree with that, but the problem is one about how this case is indicted because the predicate felony here is neglect, not abuse. Had you indicted for abuse as well, I think you would have a much more compelling argument that she is criminally responsible for Gavin's conduct under the language, and at least it creates a factual question for the jury to resolve. But I have to be able to say that Gavin is criminally responsible for the neglect as well as pulling the trigger. That's not what I'm asking the court to do. I'm asking the court to give an instruction that she is criminally responsible for the actions of Gavin, not the other way around. I understand that, but there has to be. But the predicate felony, I don't know how many times I have to keep saying this, the predicate felony is one of neglect. That's how you get to a felony murder prosecution in this case. We'll take five minutes and I'll go back and read this case in its entirety. I don't see it, but I'll give you that much. We'll stand and recess. Thank you.
And I think the understatement of the day is, General, is you and I truly were not communicating with one another. I think the state's request is to leave the language in count one that is there. I'm going to leave that language. I thought there was a request to separately define further and impose a separate theory of criminal culpability. That's not the request. So I think we're all good. Are we ready to bring the jury in and argue this case? Your Honor, there is just one more thing that we wanted to address with the court. So I know, obviously, that this is a case that involves highly emotional subjects. What we would ask is that the court instruct any family members, including the defendant, to please try and control their emotions when the parties are giving closing arguments, just like we do victims in their families. I think that's a fair request. Anyone within the courtroom that's in front or behind the bench, or the bar, rather, that's willing to accept that request, please do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. We'll take this matter under advisement. We'll call the next case. Everyone may have a seat. Wave the call for the state for the defense. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize. We kept you a little bit waiting a little bit longer than we thought we were going to. We are ready to start argument in this case. Blame me. I was the reason that we had to take a little bit longer. Let's talk a couple minutes about closing argument, and then I'm going to turn the floor over to the attorneys. Because the state has the burden of proof in this, as in every criminal case, you will hear first and last from the state. You will hear one time on behalf of Ms. Howington by Mr. Whalen. I want you to listen very carefully to what each of the lawyers argue to you. They know their case. They can point you to facts which they believe have been established within this record, as well as inferences that you may draw from those facts in order to assist you in your deliberative process when you get this case here in a couple hours from the court. I want to remind you, however, that what the lawyers say is not evidence. The evidence that you must base your verdict upon in this case must have come from this witness stand or from an exhibit 
introduced through the various witnesses who have testified or by stipulation or agreement of the parties. The state has the burden of proof. General McDermott, you are recognized on behalf of the state of Tennessee for your opening argument. September 14th, 2019. Destiny Oliver is five years old, 56 pounds, 88 inches, was shot and killed by her mother's gun, Robin Alec King's gun. In this case, ladies and gentlemen, it's about this little girl. That's what this case is about. It's about what happened to this little girl. On Balsam Drive on September 14th of 2019. You all heard all of the testimony in this case. You've heard all the witnesses. And I submit to you that the proof in this case has shown that Robin Howington's negligence, her negligence, as tragic as this is, that this little girl is dead, her negligence is the reason that this child is no longer on this earth. I want to talk about... I'm having trouble up here, Ms. McDermott. I want to talk about the night of September 14th, 2019. What was Destiny doing? You all heard testimony in this case about what she was doing. She was at a park, according to Ms. Howington. It was her, it was her mother, and her two-year-old little girl. She was at a park that day, and then they came home. You heard whenever she got home that she was hungry. She hadn't eaten that night. And so what Destiny was doing at her home on Balsam Drive, right before this incident happened, is she is sitting on her couch. She is watching TV with a remote pulled in her hand. And this little girl is waiting for her dinner. And she has no idea about what's getting ready to happen to her. As she sat there on the couch with the remote in her hand, a gun was fired. And that bullet came out of the gun, went into her hand, out of her hand, into the remote, into her chest, out the back of her body, and into that pillow. We heard from the testimony in this case what else came out of that gun besides that bullet that went through Destiny's body. We heard that there was gunshot residue particles. You all heard the testimony of Kyle Osborne, the TBI agent. He testified about how gunshots work, about when that trigger hits the back of the cartridge. If there's a projectile that's expanded, and then there's fire and gunpowder, and then out of that gun, through the cracks in the gun, as you heard that officer testify, comes these tiny microscopic particles. He testified that when a gun is fired, those particles go about five or six feet from the gun, where the gun is fired, and then they settle down. And we heard there's three different ways that gunshot residue or gunshot particles can get on a person's clothing. We heard that it can get there if you fire a weapon, if you are in close proximity, five to six feet of a weapon when it's fired. And then he also testified that you can get gunshot particles on you if you touch somebody that has gunshot particles on them. So what do we know in this case that happened? We know that Gavin, the two-year-old, has gunshot particles on him, on his clothing, on the front of his little neck t-shirt, if you all saw it. And we know that the defendant has gunshot residue or gunshot particles on her face. And so we know those three things have to be what happened in this case. 
fire the weapon, or in close proximity to the weapon, or touch someone who did one of those two things. So that's the proof that you offer, and that's what we know from that particular article. So I want to shift for a second, and I want to talk about the other things that we absolutely know in this case. Because I submit to you that the defendant has told so many stories, so many stories, so many different stories, that you're not going to be able to rely on what she says happened that night. You can't. She's told too many stories for it to be reasonable for you all to believe what she said. <clears throat> so let's start with what we absolutely know in this case. You all watched the video in this case, the video from the neighbor's camera. And it was grainy and it was kind of boring and we watched it for a long time. I'm sure it wasn't the most dynamic or interesting part of this case. But that video, ladies and gentlemen, is very important, very important. And the reason the video is important because it establishes that there are people there, and there are people going in and out of that house. And it also establishes how long the people are in the house and how many times they come and go. So that's why we're going to start with that. So the video that you watched, if you'll recall, there is a car that arrives at the beginning of that video. And I'm not going to make you watch it. Watch the whole thing here again, because you guys have already done that. You will have that video back in the jury room. You may watch it at your pleasure as many times as you want during the operation. <laughs> but what we saw in that video was that there was a car that arrived at 829.38, then leaves at 831.08, and then you can see that there's a car that arrives at 841.04, and that's going to be this car, the one with the green arrow in it up on the screen. And that car, we don't know if it's the same car as this one or if it's a different car. But we know that, that person that was in the car sat there with their lights on from 841.04 until later on. And we'll get to that. So the next thing that happens, the next part of the video that's important is this part that I have up on the screen. This portion of the video is whenever the defendant, Robin Howington, gets to the house. And she gets there at 842.43. So when she's there, that vehicle is waiting. That's uncontroversial. That's what happened. And we know that because a neighbor happens to have a video that shows this. The next thing that you see on that video is that Destiny then walks inside the house. She goes first. She walks in at 842. Excuse me, 843.28. She walks inside her home. It's kind of the last time that this little girl goes into her home. And she's followed quickly thereafter by Miss Howington, who is carrying it. So Destiny goes in, Miss Howington goes in. And then there are several minutes that this person who is in this car is sitting outside. It's not a situation where that person comes and helps her with the kids, or helps her in, or just gives her money real quick to stay over for car to put in. No, that person waits. And they wait several minutes for her to get in with her children. 8.46.05. You might have to watch the video more than one time. It's a little difficult to see. You will see right before 8.46.05 that the door is closed right here, and that 846.05, there's activity, and that door is open. And I submit to you what's happening there. So Ms. Hamilton is calling that person. Okay, it's okay now to come into my house. And then the person in the car walks up to the house and goes in. You all will stop. see in that video, you've already seen the individual goes in at 846.43 and remains in that house till 847.47, which is 63 seconds. 63 seconds. And the reason that's important, ladies and gentlemen, is because the defendant doesn't know 
about this video when she's talking to the police initially. The defendant doesn't know that the comings and goings of the people at the house has been reported. Because I don't believe there's been any testimony, there's any testimony about when Ms. Howard knew that video. Is this just fine? Ms. Howard has got to be within the record. Okay, your objection's not. Until the second interview, when the police come in with their laptop, and show her portions of that video. When she makes her initial statements, she has no idea that what happened at that house has been recorded. And that there's only 63 seconds that this person is in there. And that's important. That's important. Because it shows that her stories about what's happening inside the house are not true. Are not true. She can't come into this courtroom and say, oh, there's this fight with Anton, and there's this big struggle with the gun, and all these things that are happening. She can't say that at this point. It's not true, first of all. But it's not backed up by the video that you all were able to see, because the neighbor happened to have a video camera next door to 502 Pulse and Drive. You all saw in that video that that person comes in calmly, walks away calmly. And what's the next thing that happens? The defendant exits her home. She does that at 848.52. She leaves her home. She leaves her two children inside her house, unattended, which is fine to do, unless you have a loaded firearm in a place where a child can easily access it. That is the negligence to leave your house. Leave your two-year-old and your five-year-old in your house where there is a loaded firearm easily accessible. That is the definition of negligence. And she wants you to think, and we'll get to this in a minute, she wants you to think, oh, that gun's up in the top of the closet. Or that gun's somewhere else. The child had to have gotten on a stool and reached up to the closet and gotten from the top of the closet. That's not where that gun was, ladies and gentlemen. Think about what's just happened. I submit to you that what's just happened, consistent with what we heard about Ms. Howington, is that there is a drug transaction that happens. That person waits outside for three minutes so that she can get her kids into the house and out of the way so that he can come in or she can come in, buy some pills, and leave. She has that gun there when this transaction happens. Well, her investigator did. Well, her had testified in his numerous, numerous years of law enforcement experience about how drug transactions happen quickly and that often there are firearms there for the protection of the person that's selling the drugs or the person that's selling them. And I submit to you that's why the gun was on that gun. And the person responsible for that gun, where it was, is not Destiny. It's not Gavin. It's not these law enforcement officers. The best ones to blame for everything that happened. The person responsible for where her gun is that night is this lady. It's Ms. Howington. So Ms. Howington leaves her home, 848-52, returns after she moves her car. You all saw that on the video. She moves her car. It takes a couple minutes to do that, and then she goes back inside. After she gets in the home, there's about three minutes before she calls 911. Here's the portion of the video where she is calling 911. And this is important, ladies and gentlemen. It's important because when she calls 911, what is she doing? What are her actions? First of all, it's important to note that when 
she calls 911, her reaction to her child that has just been shot and who is mortally wounded, her reaction to that is not to get on the phone and tell the 911 operator exactly what's happened. Her choice, her decisions, <coughs> her actions, her words to the 911 operator are lies. She decides. This detective doesn't make her say anything to 911. Detective Warwell doesn't make her say anything to 911. Ms. Howington is responsible for her actions and for her words. And her immediate response to her child being shot in the chest, her immediate response is to get on the phone and call 911 and start spinning a story. Start blaming it on someone else. And why? Why? Ask yourself, why would she do that? Ms. Howington lies to 911 and spins this web of lies because she's trying to protect Gavin. She does these things because she's trying to protect herself. She's trying to protect Robin Howington. But she knows right away when she's on the phone with 911, right away that leaving her gun out and allowing her children access to her gun is her fault. And it's tragic, ladies and gentlemen. You will not hear the state say that she purposely shot her child or she wanted this to happen. That's, that's not what we're saying to you. What we are saying to you, and what the proof shows in this case, is that Destiny died because of her negligence. This was an avoidable death. And Ms. Howerton is responsible for the death of this child, as sad as it is. <coughs> so let's talk about this now on call. What I'm going to show you is the clip of the house outside synced with the 911 call. Call one. On Saturday, September 14, 2019, at 8.53 p.m., with a DMC offset of negative 240 minutes, agent ID extension is 202. I apologize for that. I have not been shown this demonstrative piece that is linking two separate incidents so that I can test myself whether or not it's correctly linked up. It's a final argument. Both of these pieces of evidence are in the record. Overruled. On Saturday, September 14, 2019, at 8.53 p.m., with a DMC offset of negative 240 minutes, agent ID extension is 202. Emergency. 
Let's go back and let's talk about this 911 call. So in the 911 call, as I said, her first reaction immediately after this happens is to blame this on someone else. To blame it on an unknown black male that came into the house and shot her drunk. And she says on the stand yesterday, but the reason that all these lies comes out is because she wants to protect Gavin. Let's talk about that for a second. She wants to protect Gavin. What does that mean? She doesn't want Gavin to know, she says, that he shot his sister. Does that really make sense? Does that really make sense? First of all, Gavin's two years old. There's one of two things that are going to happen. He's either going to remember this or he's not. If Gavin remembers what happened, there's nothing she can say or do that's going to change that. If Gavin doesn't remember, he gets older and he doesn't remember this. She can talk to him about it. She can decide that big family secret, we're not going to talk about it. He never knows about it. Or she can decide to tell him the truth about what happened and to say to him, Gavin, you were two years old. There was a gun that was not secured in the house that you got. This is my fault. She can say that. That's not what she chooses to do. She doesn't want to take responsibility for her actions. She absolutely does. It. And her course of conduct from the 911 call forward blatantly shows blatantly shows that Ms. Howington does not want to take any responsibility for anything that happened in her Any responsibility. Instead, not only does she lie to the 911 operator, she gets rid of the phone. She hides this gun. This 
gun that was used to shoot her. She takes it outside while on the phone with 911 while her daughter is in the house having been shot. It's more important for her to leave that house and to put that gun outside in the dark. You can see the gun in this picture. Remember the officer testified because he has a really bright light on his hand. Those first set of pictures, when it's come around that corner, you can see just how dark it is. Just how dark it is back in that corner of the house, the side of the house. She takes this gun that was used to shoot this little girl. Her first reaction is to take this gun and take it outside and hide it under a bush. Conscious of her own She knows that she is an honor to have to find another child. Officer Cummings gets there at 8.56.15. You all recall from his testimony that he approached uh, cautiously because he <coughs> knew there was a shooting and he didn't really know very many more details about what was happening. You all remember he was. In our second witness that we had the testimony, Officer Cummings testified that he got to the house, approached the door cautiously, and that he went inside. He says that when he went inside, that he sees the defendant sitting on the couch. And he says, has anybody been shot? What's going on? So let's talk about our next set of actions because they say, again, a lot about her mindset, a lot about what she's thinking, her deception, her lies. They are not, as the defense attorney wants you to believe, something that is caused by these officers in this case. They happen before anybody even gets there. And they continue from the point where she calls 911 the whole way up to the end of the last day. She is not truthful about what happened. Why? Why is she not truthful? Again, it's because she knows that she's responsible. She was negligent. She speaks to officers as they arrive on the scene. This is uh, one of the officer's videos that you heard on her play this portion where she's describing car there with dark window windows. So she begins this weave of trying to look for this other person who killed her child. This unknown person that's coming to the house and they have a black car that has tinted windows. And you know what? When she told that to Detective Riddle and she talked about how she's sitting on the couch and she's looking the whole way down and she can see the 
through the dark the whole way to the car, and she can describe that it's a black Chrysler and it has dark tinted windows. He thinks, oh, you know what? That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't ring true. He believes at this point in time that he has a grieving mother, but he also is aware that what she's saying doesn't make sense. Doesn't make any sense. And he gives her the benefit of the doubt. He asks her, tell, tell me more information about this unknown individual that's coming to your house. And she does. She provides additional details about this person. But this detective, obviously, when in this house and faced with this statement that this woman has seen through the first room, through the second room, out the door, out through the dark, to a car that she says is is out there, and she can describe it as a black Chrysler with dark tinted windows. Because it doesn't make any sense. And it's not true. It's not true. We know that now. It's not true. What does she say to Detective Riddle at the scene? I was in there. We were all in there. We were just trying to get rid of the rest When you say you all, it's you. Yes. Okay, you're in here. And the door was open like it is now. Okay. And what happened? And he just came in here. And we were all sitting right there. Where's he? I don't know who he is. You don't know who this guy is? I don't have a clue. I've never seen him in my life. And he walks in here. And will you show me just like no? Yes. Is there a lie? I was sitting right beside over. He was sitting right here. I was sitting right here. She was laying right here. And he just shot. And then it was like he was surprised. I don't know if he was trying to shoot me or what, but he shot me. What were you saying? I was right here. And she's right here? Right here. Right here. She was laying down right here. Did he, did he, and you were sitting down the whole time he comes in close to you? Yes. I didn't even realize he was in here until it was already. And, and what happened? One, how many times did you hear him shoot? Just one time. One time. And what, when, when he shot, what happened? Did he say anything? Nothing. He looked, he looked like he was surprised because she just went limp. So again, her statement there to Detective Riddle gives details about this event that happened that absolutely didn't happen. She provides, and then later on she tells him, you know, I looked down the hallway and I can see that it's a black car with two windows. And more importantly, more importantly, what else does she say to Detective Riddle? I think it was meant for me. I think it was meant for me. So the fact that these officers are investigating this case as if it's a homicide, it's not just because they want to do that. It's because of her actions and what she says. That's why they're investigating this case like a homicide. She's transported to UT Hospital. What's she doing on the way to UT Hospital? She's texting Callie. If I need you to get that gun, Callie, for real, ASAP. It's on the side by the air conditioner, in the bush. My phone is about to die. They are taking me to UT. She's texting her boyfriend and saying, go get that gun. That is what is most important for her at this period of time when she's on the way to the hospital. Because again, self-preservation. She knows she's done something. She texts Joe Key, go to my house, the back way, and get my gun out of the bush under the air conditioner. <coughs> Gavin shot Destiny, then come to UT, and I got you for free. She's gonna give him some pills for free for doing this for her. The police are there, but if you park in the alley and walk up, you're good because they are in the house. And she's calling, you can see in the call log, she's calling a bunch of other people. But her, her main goal there is to make sure somebody goes and gets that gun. <coughs> and she knows that these text messages are in her phone. And then she also makes a phone call. You're going to hear her say, can you do that, please? Can you do what I just text you? Can you do that, please? Calls G 
Jerky at 926. You all will recall his testimony. He says he remembers receiving a phone call. He couldn't hear what she was saying, but that this is the call that she made. And she's saying, can you do that, please? Can you do what I just texted you? And what she's just texting him is to go get the gun and avoid the police while you're doing it. We get to UT Hospital now, and again, the state is not saying that this is something that's not true. But what we are saying is that her actions, her actions that day, are very clearly showing that she is conscious of her wrongdoing. She knows that she has been negligent, and she is desperate at this point in time the police not figure out what's going on. She's so desperate, ladies and gentlemen, that when she's in the bathroom, she tries to give her phone to a complete stranger. To Marty Sands. She tries to give her her phone. She stands outside the, hall, the, the stall. You all remember Marty Sands. She stands outside the, the stall and waits for her to come out and says, take my phone. Take my phone. Marty Sands is like, oh, I'm not going to do that. So what does the defendant do after that? She runs her phone under the water. She breaks her phone. She wants to say, oh, my phone was broken before, and that's fine. Even taking her at her word, at a minimum, she took her phone, tried to give it to a stranger, and then ran it under water. Because she knows what's on these text messages. She doesn't want the police to know that she's tried to hide the gun. She's done this. I messed it up so much that Officer Pate, who had to come and testify, had to reconstruct it and let it dry out for, for hours. Put a new screen on the phone before he could look into the phone and see it was there. She continues with this. Next thing that we know that happened is that Matt, Ms. Howington is taken to uh, the police station. She is in an interview room and she is now going to explain what's going on there at the house. So I want to go through her stories because I submit to you that her stories change constantly. Constantly. Let's start with who shot Destiny. Let's talk about her different stories about who shot Destiny. And remember, the reason this is important is because the reason she has all these different stories is because she wants to deflect anything from showing that she is responsible. That is her goal in talking to the police that day, is to deflect from what she has done. And so she blames multiple people, multiple people for this shooting. Back on that one call, I'm not going to play again, but you heard, she says, this dude was just at my house, and her words, and my fucking daughter just got shot, he was black, he's in a black Chrysler, I had a man that just came to the fucking door, he came in here and he shot my daughter. That's her first story. Her statement to Detective Riddle, which we just played, he just came in here and we were all sitting right there, I don't know who he is, I don't have a clue. I've never seen him in my life. She was laying on the couch. I was sitting right beside her. He, meaning Gavin, was sitting right here. I don't know if he was trying to shoot me or what, but he shot her. I didn't realize he was in here until it was already too late. Those are her two stories, the two things that she says before the investigators speak to her. And then she comes into the interview room. She comes into the interview room and she talks to the detectives in this case, and this is what she says. We can get that done is if you tell us the truth and be helpful to us. Right? I told you. We just came home from the park and I thought somebody was following me. And so I went down the alley. There's the alley in between the neighbors where you took Gavin, or where you, whoever took Gavin, and somebody followed me. And then I didn't think nothing about it. She was laying on the couch, I turned Netflix on for her, and Gavin was sitting right beside me and have a roast. 
still drinking right now in the crock pot. I was getting ready to make the plates, and somebody came in the door, and I was sitting on the, whatever you want to call it, the footrest, and she was like this far away from me, laying there, because I was asking her, what else do you want? Because the only thing I had in the crock pot was uh, the roast and carrots. And I let them choose what they want to eat because her dad is a vegan, and so she's somewhat picky about what she eats. And I didn't even hear the door open because it was just the screen door. I had the other door still open because my purse was in the car still because I had to carry Gavin in because he didn't have shoes on. So whoever on the I seen was a black dude come in, and I heard a gunshot, and then I looked at my baby. And then I looked at him, and his eyes got big as I don't know what. Like, I feel like it was meant for me. What kind of car did it in? It was a black Chrysler. I'm almost sure it was. I'm not 100% sure, but I could see, like, out the door from where the foot thing was. So you never went outside to see the, the car? No, I got, got a towel. I got a towel and put it on her. That's her first one. Next, she starts talking about these kids at the park. In her words, this may be something. Let's see what she says. This may be something, she tells the detectives. Yes. Did y'all leave the park? Well, actually, I'll be honest with you. Um, these three boys, there's like a, this may be something. I don't know. But these three Mexican boys, there's like a fence or whatever, and there's like a bench right beside the fence, and they kept on crawling over it, going to this building that's right beside of the park. I don't know what it is. I have no idea. So the boys were making comments about my press. So I said, you guys are old enough to be talking to me like this, especially in front of my kids. I was like, you're already teaching my son bad things because he's trying to crawl over the fence too. So I went and pulled up because when I walked back up to them, they bring in and cross the fence again. And when they crossed the fence, um, I drove up there to see if their parents were there. Well, their parents was there and it was two Mexican men. And I said, you need to teach your sons to be more respectful because they were being very disrespectful and talking to me in ways that I didn't appreciate, especially in front of my daughter. And so did she you drop off after that? Yes, sir. Yeah, baby. So she tells the police, once she's talking to them, that it may be something, there's a thing going on at the park that uh, involves these three Mexican boys. She knows that has to be nothing. She knows that has nothing. Instead, she starts talking about these other people that it could be. Here's her next statement. Through the alley? Yeah, because I felt somebody, like somebody was following me. So you thought somebody was following you yes. from the park? No, I don't know from the park. I wasn't paying that much attention because they were complaining that they were thirsty and they were hungry and all this. So I was just consoling them, telling them we're going to be home, you know, the rose is done. Um, basically, Destiny was the one that was talking. So when did you first think that somebody was following you? When I turned um, left off over Ridge Highway onto Shaw Road. Okay. So what kind of vehicle was that? I'm not sure. It was a dark colored car. I'm, I'm not sure. So you said think a dark colored car was yes, following you at that time? Yes, sir. But you just and you still you go straight on home? Yeah, but I went through the alley, and when I went through the alley, nobody was behind me, so I didn't think nothing of it. So, so when did you, so this dark colored car that you thought was following you, when did you not see it following you? Um, when we stopped at the red light on Callahan, they were behind me. Callahan and, like Callahan and Clinton. Central. That's Central. Callahan and Central by the Wilds. So right there by the Wilds and, I guess I'm couple of restaurants and stuff that you didn't see anymore at that point. Where Asian Cafe used to be, correct. So you didn't see a car anymore at that point. Correct. And then you go on to your house. Correct. And again, here she is telling these police officers who she has made them think that there is a homicide of this child about 
think you need to be looking into this other car that I believe to follow me. When she knows, she knows this has nothing to do with anything that happened. Her next statement. She's going to start talking about Anton. Now, the defense wants you to think, well, the only reason that she said it was Anton is that these police officers overbore her will and made her say it. And that is just not true. They were looking at a story that wasn't making sense. Wasn't making sense to them. That some unknown person would just come and get this job. And now they have her saying that she can see this black Chrysler from a place they know she can't do that. And then they have her trying to get rid of her phone and putting it under water. And so they look at what's available, the police reports, and they say there is a domestic history of this Anton guy. So to them, is this what this is about? And they ask her that. Now, does she have to say, oh, yeah, I was Anton? Does she have to do that? No. No. Miss Howington is responsible for the things she does and the things she says. She could have told these officers, no, Anton has nothing to do with this. But she chose not to do that. This is what she says. So why didn't you tell us that earlier? Because, I mean, this is his daughter, too. I know that he killed her, but I just don't feel like he did it on purpose. I don't feel like he was trying to kill me. So he was already there. Do you have any, what, what happens? He tried to talk. He came to the house. And when he came to the house, I told him I didn't want to talk to him. And he went back outside the house. Okay. Then what happened? And he came back in. Just, he brought Bill back in with him? Yes. So is this gun that Kelly gave you, how long have you had it? Not very long. And it was in the house tonight? No. That gun never was in the house tonight, unfortunately. So, with that being said, if we told you there was a gun found outside, and we want to make sure that it's not the gun you said Kelly gave you, would you mind giving us DNA so we can make sure it's not? I don't understand what you're saying. So there's a gun found outside? Right. You said Kelly gave you a gun at some point? Right. We want to make sure that that's not the gun that Kelly gave you. The way we do that is DNA. Would you mind giving us your DNA so we can make sure that's not the gun? I'm saying Kelly did give me that gun. I know that. Okay. And you're saying you don't know where that gun is at now? Correct. Right. But there was a gun outside your house? Correct. So to make sure that that's not the same gun that Kelly gave you, we'll run your DNA against the DNA found on that gun. Do you mind if we get DNA so we can do that? I guess it is the gun that Kelly gave me, yeah. He told me he put it outside and he was supposed to put it in storage. So now, first of all, she throws Anton completely under the bus. He came in and he murdered this child in cold blood. That's what she tells the officer. She goes so far as to circle him in a lineup, circle his face, and to say, this is the person that killed the child. Now, is she doing that to protect Gavin like she wants you to do? Or is she doing that to protect herself? And then, when the police confront her, because they've found out from the officers on the scene that there's a gun that's outside the house, she doesn't say, okay, I put it out there. She says, oh, there was a gun in my house. Is it the one outside? I don't know. And then she says, oh, Callie put the gun outside. Which absolutely is the truth. We know that. So this story is Anton brings the gun inside. He leaves, comes back, excuse me, Anton came into the house, leaves, comes back in with the gun, and then shoots Destiny. And we know that's not true because we've seen the video. Nobody comes in the house and leaves and comes back in. That just didn't happen. This is a complete lie. And then she changes her story yet again. Okay. 
So now she's saying, you haven't got a hold of the gun. That's the honest to God truth. She's swearing this is what happens. And more importantly, she's saying Anton is still there. Why is it so important for Miss Howington to say that someone else is there? Why does she say Anton's still there, ladies and gentlemen? Why does she say that? Because she knows that if Anton was there, that's somebody she can blame. That's somebody she can blame for how that gun is out for a child kid. And she is so desperate at this point in time to not be in trouble for her actions that she is willing to circle Anton's picture in a lineup and say that this person murdered her child. That's what she does. And when they say to her, after she changes her story, that this is, you know, after she changes it and says it again, hey, you almost had us arrest this guy for first-degree murder? What did she say about that? She doesn't say, oh, yeah, you're right, that's crazy. She doesn't show any remorse. She doubles down and talks about how much she doesn't like it. That's the mindset of this individual who's involved in this case. So here we have a story. Gavin got a hold of the gun. Antoine is there. That's going to change. Now we're on the following day. You need to fix the road store in here. Mm -hmm. Or get out to see if they need to get ready to um, run. I didn't actually turn it off, but it was um, it was definitely mm -hmm. just like that. And Anton came to the door, and he was screaming and hollering about Tally yet again. Like, I don't know what the hell he has against Tally, but he got to screaming and hollering about Tally. And we got to arguing, and you know, we kind of tussled a little bit, and I asked him to please leave. And he was like, oh, I know what you're going to do. You're a police call, bitch. You're going to call the police, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So he left. And then when I went in the kitchen, Gavin went into my room, and Esme was laying on the couch watching Netflix. And I came back and sat down, and so now in this story, Antoine had been there, there had been a scuffle, there had been a tussle. He leaves, and in this story, Gavin goes in the bedroom while she's in the kitchen, he gets the gun, and then comes back in and shoots Jessica. And then here's her final story. This is the last one that she tells the police on September 17th of 2019. Okay. Was Antoine already there when you got home? The neighbor said he had been there. Remember when I said I want you to, I want you to tell me stuff that you hadn't told me before? Yes, you, know. you need to tell me that. He got out of the car and I left. Okay. Let's keep on And I asked Destiny what she wanted to eat and he kept trying to interfere. And so and he don't like her to eat me. So that was a problem right there. Anything that I do that he can find a problem with, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. So he don't he didn't want her to eat me first off, so he started on that shit too. And he just continued to scream and holler and raise his voice. And he went, I thought he was leaving. He went in the living room, so I was like, please leave. But he didn't leave, and I don't know, I felt threatened because I didn't know what the hell he was capable of. I mean, he's beating me to the point where I was unconscious. And I went out the gun when I got it. He well, got it from me. Where was it going? It was in the black bag on the back of the door. It's in the black bag on the back door. You got it out. On the back of my bedroom door. Yes, yeah, sir. So now we still have this is Anton. This is Anton's fault. What does she admit? What does she finally admit? 
after blaming everybody else. Here, in this version, she admits that she went and got the gun out of a black bag. Still wants to throw in that this is Anton's fault and all this other stuff. But what did we hear yesterday? Anton's not even there. He's not even there. He doesn't have anything to do with this. And here in this version, she finally admits that she's the one that went into the bedroom and got the gun not from the top of the closet, but from her purse that's on the back of the door. So I want to talk about not just this changing story of who did this, but I want to talk about some other things. And the reason that these things are important is because what you are going to see and what you've heard in this case is a pattern of blaming other people and not taking any responsibility whatsoever until Ms. Allen is confronted with things that she cannot get away from. And then she finally says, she has some responsibility, just like she did here. She gives all these stories, and it's not until the last story, when, again, she's not telling the whole truth, but in the last story, she finally says, I'm the one that went in the bedroom and got the gun. So now we're going to talk about where did the gun come from. And so it's important for her, because, again, she knows she's negligent. It's important for her to tell the police that this gun is secure and put away in somewhere where a child shouldn't have access. So her story to the police is that this gun is in the top of the closet. And she gives many versions about how it comes out of the top of the closet that are inconsistent with each other. But she wants them to believe that the gun in her home is in the top of the closet because, again, she doesn't want there to be any responsibility on her part. So let's go through her statements about how the gun came into the room. We, we heard her last statement about her going to get it. But let's, let's walk through kind of the, the different statements she gives about this. First, let's try this. We'll, we'll go back to your story. Because you said he knew where the gun was. So, so where were you going from there? When you said he knew where the gun was. He knew where the gun was because he was in my room one day when he just showed up and he seen it in the closet when I was getting my clothes out to get dressed. Okay, so how does that factor into tonight? That's where he went it from. So you're telling me he went and got that gun, and that's the gun he used? And he put it down after he shot his child. And you picked it up, and you took it out to the bush, and you've done something possibly with the shell casing? No, I didn't touch it. So it's probably somewhere in your house. So in that statement, she's saying that Anton gets the gun on the top of the closet. She gives all these details about what's happening surrounding her, and then she changes that. The next thing she's going to say is that her two-year-old gets a stool from inside of the living room, drags it the whole way through the room to her bedroom, climbs up on the stool, and gets the gun from the top of the closet. Because again, she wants the police to think that she has responsibly secured this gun, that she's put it in the top of the closet. Her kids shouldn't have access. Not true. But here she's saying Gavin gets the gun out of the closet and that she saw him take the stool across the room and do, and do that. Um, is this putting squat on in here? Okay. Yep. You're ridiculous, Robert. Okay. You run through and tell us. Before we leave, we'll get a picture. 
Yes, sir. Did you see him moving the stool? Yes. So in this version, she is saying that she saw Gavin get the stool, take the stool to the closet, climb up. I don't suppose she said she saw him climb up in the stool. But what he would have had to do is climb up in the stool and get the gun from the top of the closet. That's the walkthrough that happened in September 4th, early of September 15th. And so then we have her come in just a couple days later, September 17th of 2019, and here's what she says. The officer's gonna ask her, did you see him get the gun out of the closet? Move the you stool. saw him get the stool. Now you're saying you didn't see him get the stool. So, Judge Nurse. I, I didn't make a mistake. Correct. Right? You did you make a mistake, but I would think that that wouldn't be, you know, a mistake you made right there, right? And so he, Detective Wardlaw says to her, you told us before that you saw him get the gun, or excuse me, saw him get the stool, and now you're saying that you didn't. She says, oh, I made a mistake. That's not a mistake. She is lying. And the reason it's important, as I've said before, for her to lie about this is because she knows that the poli police need to be thinking that that gun is in the top of the closet. Because that's the only way she's not negligent. And because of what she says, Gavin has to get measured. Officer Tonkin there, they've got a gunny bear, he's reaching up. He's 45 inches. He's not tall enough to reach a purse in the top of the closet. And then what does she say finally? Her last statement to the police. After she's blamed it on Anton, after she's blamed it on Gavin going in the top of the closet, what does she say? I got the gun. That's what she says there. I got the gun. Where did the gun come from, ladies and gentlemen? Mm -hmm. I should probably mention too, September twelfth, a couple days before this, this is part of her story that she's telling. Starts with saying there's this tussle and all this other stuff that's happening with Callie and with Anton and her. And finally, this is her final version. Not she had said before different things, but this is the last thing she says about September 12th. And so Callie never pulled a gun. Right. Okay. That Callie never pulled a gun on Anton. It was her that pulled a gun on Anton. She finally admits that well into this interview, September 17th. How does the gun end up outside? We've heard some, some of her explanations. I'm gonna walk through the litany of things she says about this. First, she's like, what gun? I don't have a gun. I don't have a gun in the house. Huh? watch this. Um, did you want a gun? Never had a gun? Do you want to surprise you if you told me that a gun was found outside the house? That would surprise you. Why not? Yes, it would surprise me. First, she says, No, I don't have a gun. I don't, I don't have a gun. That would surprise me. Then she says, No. no. Where's it at? Wherever he put it. Cal it Callie had a gun. I guess it does where he put it. Cal Callie's the one that put the gun outside the house, is what she's saying. She comes up here on the stand yesterday and wants to say, Callie's the one. Callie's the one. Allie's the one that took the gun in the house, and she didn't bother to look for it. Here she is playing with Callie. What's next? So between the time when the shooting happened and you called 911, the police got there. What did you do? I sat there and held this house, my baby. You never realized you went outside. Try to get rid of anything. Mm -hmm. you know. No. 
She never went outside. She never tried to get rid of anything. I don't know. I guess he's moving to the outside. She says Anton took the gun outside. So why did you feel like you needed to take that side? I didn't realize that she was shot until after the fact. And then finally she says she took the gun outside. But here she says, I didn't realize that she had been shot until after I took the gun outside, which we know is not true. Because she's taken the gun outside on the phone with 911. So she's finally admitting that she took the gun outside, but she's still telling lies about how that happened. You all will have these clips. I'm not going to belabor this point, but in this version, she says, I took the damn gun outside and didn't know what to do. So she finally admits that she took the gun outside. Gun up. Simple fact of was this gun used to kill Destiny? Was the gun that was used to kill Destiny? She told lies about that as well. So the gun that we found outside that Kelly gave you, we test fired the gun. It's not going to match anything with this. No. Have you ever used a shotgun before? No. So you don't know how to use a gun? No. So what's the chances that you were scared today, you had the gun, and you shot by mistake? No. That didn't happen? No, sir. You never got, you never got the gun until after you called 911 and you thought that you'd get in trouble for that? Right. So you're sticking with the fact that Antoine did this? Yes. So here she's saying the gun that's outside is not the gun that was used to kill Destiny, which we know is not true. Then she changes her story, but she's still blaming Anton. Is that now the murder weapon? I'm just asking. If it is, tell us it is. If it's the, if it's the weapon he used tonight and you took it outside, tell me the truth. Is it the murder weapon? Because I think we've got ballistics and we're going to be able to take them. I want you to hear it from your mouth. I want to hear it from the horse's mouth. Do you want this gun? Yes, I do want this Yes, that's the gun that was used to kill Destiny. But she's still playing an Antoine. And I submit to you what she's doing here. And throughout all of these interviews, as I said before, is that she makes up stories. She deflects everything from Robin Mountain. And it's not until she is confronted with evidence or like here, we're going to do ballistics on this gun. And she finally tells the truth. The last thing I want to do, ladies and gentlemen, is I want to go through the elements of this offense. You all heard in Board Dyer that uh, what the state of Tennessee has to prove in this case, we have the burden of proving this case beyond a reasonable doubt. We talked in Board Dyer about what that means. You all recall we talked about how. The state has to prove the elements of the offense beyond the reasonable doubt. And so I want to walk through briefly the elements of the charged offenses in this case. The first offense that the defendant is charged with is felony murder. I anticipate you will hear from the court and you all will have these instructions back in the jury room. So uh, if you want to take notes, obviously you can, but you will have this information back in the jury room is that the defendant, or one for whom the defendant is currently responsible, unlawfully killed Destiny and Oliver. And two, that the killing was committed in the perpetration of, or the attempt to perpetrate, the alleged aggravated child neglect. That is, 
that the killing was closely connected to the alleged aggravated child neglect and was not a separate and distinct and independent event. And then finally, the defendant intended to commit the alleged aggravated child neglect. So those are the elements the state has to prove in this case beyond the two doubt in order for you all to find the defendant guilty of felony murder. And we'll come back to that in just a second because basically what this is is, is that the state has to show the defendant or someone she's criminally responsible for unlawfully killed Destiny Oliver. And we know that that is the case here. And then also we have to prove the defendant intended to commit aggravated child neglect. And we have to prove the aggravated child neglect. And these are the elements for aggravated child neglect. First, that the defendant knowingly neglected a child, Destiny Oliver, so as to adversely affect her health and welfare. And ladies and gentlemen, the death of this child is an adverse effect on her health and welfare. It could be less. You can have aggravated child neglect where a child is seriously, seriously, seriously injured and not dead. But obviously, the ultimate adverse effect on your health and welfare is when somebody is deceased. And so clearly that element has been met in this case. That the act of neglect resulted in serious bodily injury to the child. Again, serious bodily injury is defined under the law to include death. And it's undisputed in this case that Destiny Oliver is dead. We have shown you beyond reasonable doubt that second element. And that the child in this case is eight years of age or less. And we've heard testimony in this case that Destiny was five years old. We've heard about her birthday, October. And we gave the exact date and the exact day. Five-year-old child. And so the state has proved in this case all of these elements. And we're going to ask you to find her guilty of aggravated child neglect. That's the second count. The third count is similar to the second count. She's not going to be punished twice for the same thing. But it's another theory of what happened. And under the law, the first element is exactly the same. The third element is exactly the same. But this time, because there's a deadly weapon involved, we're going to ask you to find her guilty. Because there is a deadly weapon that was used to accomplish this act. A firearm in this case. The defendant is also guilty of false report. She initiated a report or a statement to law enforcement concerning an offense or an incident within the officer's concern. And so there are many false reports in this case. But we are required to elect for you which specific false report that we're talking about so that we can have a unanimous verdict. And so in this particular case, we're going to ask for you all to focus on her report to Detective Brittle that an unknown male shot her daughter. And we submit to you that that is something that is absolutely false. And the defendant knew the information relating to the offense reported was false. We ask you to find her guilty of that offense. She is also charged with tampering with evidence. Count four has to deal with the firearm in this case. So she tampered with the phone. She tampered with the firearm. So count four, we're dealing with the firearm. Count five. Count five. Count five, excuse me. Thank you. Count five, the firearm. The defendant knew an investigation was pending and was in progress. And the defendant concealed a firearm with the intent to impair its availability as evidence in this investigation. She took that firearm. She took it outside into the dark while on the phone with 911, put that firearm under the bush, and then called her friends and asked them to come get it. Clearly tampering with evidence. And then finally, attempted tampering with evidence. We're talking about here the cellular phone. The defendant knew an investigation was pending and was in progress. And the defendant, there's going to be a definition of attempt, and then you're going to have this definition. So basically what we're doing here is we're talking about an attempt. So we're saying the defendant attempted to alter a cellular phone with the intent to impair its availability as evidence in the investigation. What did we hear that she did in the phone? Even if we give her the benefit of the doubt and say, okay, that phone's face was frozen before any of this happened, she still ran it under the water and tried to give it away to a lady in the back row. And that is very clearly meets this definition of attempted tampering with evidence. We ask you to find her guilty of that. So I want to go back really quick 
and talk for just a minute about felony murder. Because I think sometimes when people hear the word felony murder, they think, oh, murder. When we hear the word murder, most people think an intentional act. Somebody did something on purpose. Somebody did something premeditated. That's not what we're talking about here in this case. These are the elements. It doesn't have to be premeditated. It doesn't have to be on purpose, intentional. What we have to show is that there was an aggravated child neglect and the child died. And that those things were not separate and distinct. She died because of the neglect in this case. Because of that gun being in a place where her child had access to it. So the last thing I want to say to you all before I sit down is that the defendant has gotten up on the stand and she has now given her version, her newest version. After five years of this case pending, she has now come up on the stand and given her version of what happened. And I submit to you that even if you take every single thing that she said as the gospel truth, which I don't think it would be unreasonable for you not to do that, but even if you did, if you took everything that she said on this stand as the truth, she has admitted on this stand that there was a gun in her house. In her version of events, she has no idea where it is. And it is left in her house for two days in a place that her two-year-old child could find it in two minutes, three minutes, while she's outside. That's her version that she's telling now. And so again, even if you take everything she says as the gospel truth in this case, she has committed this offense. She is guilty of these, these crimes. And we're going to ask you all that whenever you go back, look at the evidence, think about how she was acting throughout the course of this investigation, and that you hold her responsible. You hold her responsible for her negligence that day and find her guilty. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, don't discuss the case yet. You've only heard part of it. Let's take a five-minute recess, and we'll come back and hear Mr. Weber. All rise for the jury. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're here for the regular docket, it's obviously going to be some period of time before we get started on that, so just bear with us. We'll stand in recess for about five minutes.
We ready to line the jury up? All right, get the jury lined up. General Ammons. Uh, Everyone may have a seat. Wave the call for the state. Wave the call. Wave the call. Mr. Whalen, you were recognized on behalf of Ms. Howington for your final argument. Thank you, Good morning. I know that he sets Tuesday. You may have noticed a part. I don't want you to hold it against me. Howington, if that has annoyed you. Oh, I got the cough drop, and I'm doing the best I can under the conditions you find me in. Which is exactly what this case is about. I told you in opening statement that this is a family tragedy that the state is trying to find a way to make worse. What condition was Miss Howling in when all this was happening? She told them twice, once at the house, about two minutes and 40 seconds into the discussion there, and again in that interview room, about 10 minutes, and, well, within the first 10 minutes, and she has PTSD. They, have, they know she has PTSD. No one's, gonna, no one's denied that. They went through her first, found all the meds. What's this for? It's all PTSD medicine. We talked about this at Gordon Iron, and some of you have had personal experience with family members and friends. We talked about how it makes you, makes you want to isolate and be quiet. And so what do they say about that? Well, she was quiet. She didn't seem quite as, as upset as we thought she should. That's what PTSD medicine does. It keeps you from being excited. But they said, that's suspicious. Yeah, it's got to be suspicious because we don't recognize accidents. The hammer has left the room. There's got to be a motive. Not if it's an accident. <clears throat> well, I guess not if it's an accident. Then in that interview, <coughs> Again, she's not quite as emotional as they think she should be. She says, I'm a little scared. Wardlaw says, your child is dead and you don't want to talk to us. You don't care. She says, not that I don't care. I told you I was raped by a police officer. And in this rapport building exercise that Mr. Riddle was conducting, she got this response.
If you tell us the truth, then by George, I'll call the damn DA's office and tell them, hey, we'll s- slow a roll here. But if you're going to sit here and bullshit us on this, then we're not going to help you. She tells them she's raped by a police officer. Now she's in the room with two police officers, and one of them appears to be insane. That is not a rational act. This is from a man who claims part of his unit's responsibility is investigating rape cases. Would you like to be a a rape victim in Mr. Riddle's interview room? Would you wish that on your worst enemy? Now, the state's going to tell you that she lied over and over. She lied, she lied, she lied. It's made up these stories. You know exactly what she told them and when she told them. For the first time, another person that Gavin killed Jesse. And it's 15 minutes, 10 minutes maybe after the shooting that she is texting Joey, I need you to come pick up that gun. I put it beside the house. Gavin killed Jesse. So this whole thing comes down to, she just put all those elements up there on the board. Did she knowingly place the gun in a place where Gavin could get a hold of it. Ladies and gentlemen, you will look for the court for the law. I will instruct you on the law as soon as all the argument is concluded. If there is a discrepancy between what the lawyers are telling you the law is and what the court instructs you the law is, the court is who you look to for the law. Go ahead with your argument. So, The whole incident they show you on the neighbor's video, from the time she gets home with the kids from about 8.42 till the 911 call is made at 8.53. We're talking about 11 minutes of this woman's life in the most horrible moments of her life. In this 11 minute span, She did not plan to come home from the park and fix dinner and have her son shoot her daughter. This was not a planned event, so she hadn't thought ahead about how this was going to work. But like we talked about in Vore Dyer, people with PTSD get triggered. Well, she got triggered. A gun is fired in the house. Her daughter has been shot. She's not allowed to go to the hospital. She's taking a police car. They play that little snippet for you to say, she's calling Joey and saying, hey, can you do what I asked you to do? Can you do what I texted you? They didn't play the part where she says, oh my God, I hope my baby's okay. God, please let my baby be okay. Please let my baby be okay. Have officer, you heard anything about the condition of my baby? They didn't play that part. They didn't stop that when they were doing it with the officer say, hey, did you hear that? No, because it doesn't fit their cold, calculating story. And was there any evidence that Robin Howington is a negligent mother? Did you hear from DCS to come in here and tell you, oh, God, we've had all these problems. Oh, it's horrible. These poor children. In fact, what did the medical examiner's report show? A normally developed, well-nourished child. And let's let's be honest. You heard a lot of questioning that we are about. Would you would you leave a child who had been injured? Would you leave a child who'd been injured? Would you leave a child who'd been injured? I shouldn't have to speak these words in front of the child I, I apologize. This is a tragedy. 
the medical examiner told you. That's the equivalent of a bad injury, for approximately 15 to 30 seconds. That's the reserve of oxygen at that point. Her heart's not beating, it's not taking oxygen from the lungs to the brain. Within 15 to 30 seconds, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, she was dead. You've heard the facts. I suggest to you that in the time it took her to see that flash and figure out where the gun was, where Gavin was, where Destiny was, that Destiny was not moving and not responding, Destiny was gone. The 911 call is three minutes long. Officers don't arrive for another couple of minutes. God love Officer <coughs> Thomas. He's the only he's the only individual in this government process who can answer <coughs> Riddle's question, don't you have a heart? Don't you have a soul? And he can say yes. Because he's got a heart as big as all outdoors. He picks that child up, he carries her outside. He knows she's dead. He's been trained EMT. Yeah, I talked to him about that. He's got no heartbeat. He's got no breathing. You've got no heartbeat. You've got no breathing. You are dead. The best he could say, he didn't even want to say it on that stand. Through tears, he didn't want to say it. He said, clinically, she was dead. Clinically, she'd been dead for a few minutes before he got there. That's just, that's just the unfortunate truth. She shouldn't have to relive this because she shouldn't be on trial for an accident. They're, they just got up here and told you, we're not saying she wanted the child dead. She, we're not saying she killed the child herself. We're just holding her responsible for the fact that the child got a hold of the gun. And what were the circumstances leading up to the child getting a hold of the gun? First off, two days before, you've been told, and Ms. Howington told them, and they corroborated by speaking to Mr. Oliver, Mr. Oliver Howard. Good to see you again. Uh, and to Callie. And when they spoke with Mr. Oliver and spoke with Callie, they they corroborated the story of what happened on the 12th. Some differences in whether or not who the instigator was. He's at her house, he's angry at Callie. Angry at Callie's there. She asked him to leave, he won't leave. It's the same man who lost her, her 17, 16 year old child at the time because she put her in the hospital and the father ran and got emergency relief and got custody of her child while she was out of consciousness in the hospital due to a being administered by Mr. Oliver. She told him that. And this case can tell you now they didn't force her to say anything about Antoine Oliver. They didn't make her say that. I'm going to tell you, as far as I'm concerned, 10 minutes and 30 seconds into that interview, that interview ended. You can't take a woman who's got PTSD, who's just watched her child be killed in her house, in front of her, by her other child, jump up and down, yell and scream and cuss at her and tell her she's got no heart, she's got no soul, and then say, let's continue. Yeah, I think that might have triggered her like she needed any more triggering. You think they, she needed, did Robin Howington need for either Mr. Wardlaw or Mr. Riddle to tell her, your daughter's dead. She was well aware of that fact. And I will give Mr. Riddle credit. When he took that stand and I asked him, now, if it was an officer's shooting, 
officer would be given time to review his records, his reports, maybe video. They kind of hemmed and hawed with me for a minute, and they said, okay, okay, yeah, policy on and off has been 48 to 72 hours to reconcile the facts. This is a trained police officer. A trained law enforcement officer would get 48 hours to 72 hours. He didn't mention anything about an immediate short, immediate brief statement like Mr. Wardlaw did. He said 48 to 72 hours to reconcile the facts. This woman who is suffering from PTSD, who has been at Chuck E. Cheese and then out to the friend's house, and then to the park, and then comes home to feed her children, and then suffers the worst tragedy she has ever suffered, that her son gets hold of the gun and shoots her daughter. She gets questioned immediately at the house. They don't let her go to the hospital where her daughter is. <coughs> they take her to the hospital an hour after the shooting, about 10.06. The doctor declares her daughter dead, comes into the room and tells her that. Forty so or so minutes later, she's in an interview room at KPD. Not 48 hours. 40 minutes later. State just loves those clips. Going to show you those clips. They can play all the videos that exist in the world, and that's not going to convert this from a family tragedy to a murder. It's not. But one thing that is interesting is that when you look, if you look at those clips at any other time, notice the time on them. 12:45. 1.45, they're back at her house with her at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. She has been with them for a work day on the worst night of her life. And they want to say, well, then she said this, it wasn't true, and this, it wasn't true. So see, that means she's guilty. Not that she's confused. In fact, not that Miss McDermott stood up there and said, let me show you this other video that happened the next day. It was two days later. Did she lie to you? No, she was confused. Can you imagine if she was confused in a courtroom where she works, in a job that is her profession, to deal with questions and answers and facts. Miss Howington was being interviewed on the worst day of her life about the worst possible circumstances. And she needs to get everything right. And if we talk about why those officers might need 48 or 72 hours, think about some of the things Ms. Howington told them. They talked about in that 17th story that she was telling them that on the night of the killing, that Antoine gets the gun and he takes the thing out of it. He's trying to take the thing out of it. That's what she told them happened on the 12th and what they verified happened on the 12th. He, got, he took the gun away from her. She pulls the gun. He takes the gun away. She pulls the gun and says, leave. He won't leave. He snatches the gun from her. She doesn't shoot him. She didn't even have her finger on the trigger because if it did, when he snatched the gun, it would have fired. She's got the gun in her hand trying to make him leave. He won't do it. He takes it, breaks it apart, throws it down, and Callie went and got it. So Oliver said that, and Callie said that. And the officer testified. Mr. Riddle did, and he questioned them, and yes, that's what they said about what happened on the 12th. So Callie's the last person with a gun. She says, she tells you, I told him, put it away. Now, she's just been in this confrontation with Mr. Oliver. He's taken a gun away from her and thrown it. Uh, Callie's gone to pick it up. Do you really think she wants to deal with the gun again? She says, put it away two days before the shooting. The state would have you ask, ma'am, why didn't you go in there the next day and check and see where that gun was? <coughs> so for two whole days, you had to look to see where your gun is? How often do you go look and see where your gun is? 
she tells him it's in the closet on the shelf because that's where I keep it. She tells him Gavin had to climb up there on the stool because Gavin got the gun. And remember, that's what we're charged with, that Gavin got the gun. And that Ms. Howington allowed that to happen, and that's negligence, and it resulted in a death. So they're giving you that Gavin got the gun. She's in this room in her mental state that she possesses at that moment. As one of you described, how could a mother be in her right mind under those circumstances? She is under those circumstances, and she's trying to figure out how the hell did Gavin get the gun? Well, he must have got on the stool. He must have got to the closet, because that's where the gun is, because that's where she keeps it. The truth of the matter, as she told you yesterday was, after Callie, she asked him to put it away, she had never told Callie where she kept the gun. He didn't know where she kept the gun. He went and put it away, wherever away he is at that point. So when they ask her where was the gun, she tells him where she keeps it. In reality, she's not thinking that Callie moved, had it two days ago, and I don't know where, where he put it. I just assume it's where I keep it. Not the right assumption, but under the circumstances, understandable. If you want to understand it, if you believe accidents are possible, or if you don't, and you just think that everything should be a murder, it's gotta be a murder, there's gotta be a motive, then sure, prosecute this house due to that. But that's not the facts of this case. They didn't tell her, they didn't make her put, uh, throw Antoine under the bus, as, as she said. By God, they did. There's Mr. Wardlaw right there. What did he say to her? I'm going to shoot you straight. I think it was very bad. I think he was upset that you were with Callie. The whole situation, and he came in and he shot her. And then the hammer spoke up. He says, I think so too. He hit the nail right on the head. You can't ask for a better sentence than he hit the nail right on the head because he's the hammer. He doesn't believe that every homicide is not a murder. It's got to be a murder. And he's running around hitting the microphone because that's a nail. Hit the lights, those are nails. To a hammer, everything's a nail. And that explains his discussion with Miss Allington. No, you're not a grieving mother. No, you're not a rape victim. No, you're not a, a sufferer of PTSD. You're a liar. And fibbers are always fibbers. But well, what did these two gentlemen tell her? She's explaining to them how Kevin could have got this gun and how he shot his sister. Ma'am, that's not possible. That child couldn't pull the trigger. That's not true. It didn't happen. It's not possible. Now, put, think about this for a minute. Ms. Howington knows what happened. She knows Gavin pulled the trigger. And she's got two professional investigators telling her, not physically possible, it didn't happen. That's going to be hard for anybody to say, I know what I know. Why are you telling me that's not possible? Well, compound that with a person who has PTSD, is medicated for PTSD, and has just been yelled, screamed at by an insane police officer who's telling her she has no soul and no heart. Were they lying? Because the TBI expert said, yeah, there's a, there's a study that was done, and three and four year olds, 25% of them, can pull the trigger on a gun with 10 pounds of trigger pull. Now, I know, I'm in big trouble because Gavin's not three. That's the youngest study they did, three and four year olds. Gavin is not three, Gavin is two and a half. And this is a five pound trigger pull. He said, as to this gun, in this case, it 
is possible for him to have pulled that trigger. So they lied to her. Well, wait a minute, Mr. Ray, that's not fair. Maybe they didn't know at the time. Maybe that's really the strongly held belief. How come she doesn't get that same break? How come she can't be confused? How come she has to get all of it correct the first time around, 40 minutes after being told her child is dead? And then for four hours into the night, into the wee hours of the morning, she's got to have it right. They wouldn't even have talked to the cops at that point. If it had been a police officer shooting, they wouldn't even have talked to him yet. We're still within 12 hours. He said, we're not the first 48 hours. We know it's very important for investigation. First 48 minutes? Yeah. It's not when it's a cop involved <coughs> shooting. And then, Ms. McDermott stood right here at this lectern and asked, Mr. Riddle, Mr. Riddle, isn't it true that police-involved shootings are different? Yes, it is. And she stopped. All shootings be different than any other shooting. Well, they're just different. Well, Mr. Riddle is a human being, a police officer or a citizen, using a gun, pulling the trigger, and someone getting injured and killed. Well, yeah. <clears throat> so, it's not different at all, is it? Well, I guess not. Now, one has to ask why would you ask that question? And why did he say yes, knowing they weren't there? That's called perjury when you do it on the dimensionary. When you raise your hand and say you'll tell the truth, and then just in a knee-jerk reaction to a bad question of, well, aren't they different? Yes, ma'am. That's perjury. Why would he do that? He knew better. He absolutely knew better. So let me tell you why I think he did it. Because this, this, and this, that, well, a couple of those got two sides. This box and all these photographs and all these discs, there is no proof that Miss Howington knew where that gun was because Callie had put it away. So there's no proof that she knowingly made that gun available to the child and as a negligent act. So, blow smoke. What's the biggest smoke? Let's talk for a moment about those 63 seconds. How many times did Ward Law and Riddle tell her, we ain't the dope police lady? We don't care about them. They were at her house within two minutes of the 911 call. They were there for another, that's 9 o'clock in the middle of the I'll give them a few minutes. Let's say 9 o'clock at night, the police were on, so we're a few minutes earlier. They were there until 4 o'clock in the morning at least. Did anybody show you any evidence that they found Roxy's in her house? She had a purse full of prescription bottles. Did anybody show you any Roxy's that were in her purse? Did anybody say she had baggies or packaging or Roxy's in the house somewhere? So why are we talking about that? Because in that and that and that and all that up there, they don't have the evidence they need. So they just want to throw things at the wall and say, that's a bad woman convicted. She was doing a drug deal with Mr. Key. Mr. Key, he's an interesting fellow, too. He testified on Friday at a hearing and said, I said, they said, how'd you know Miss Howard? Oh, I met her through friends in the neighborhood. Who, what kind of friends? Oh, I did work for people in the neighborhood. They referred her to me. And she was willing to pay me a decent wage, so I, I did. That's not an evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, you will judge which facts are before you and which are not. If they are facts not in evidence, you may not consider them. Go ahead. And I, 
I knew her for, I was doing odd jobs for her. And then I got some I got some pills from her because my grandma was dying. And I got some pills from her. That was on Friday. Tuesday, we testified. Sir, I bought pills from her. And I asked him on the cross. I said, wait a minute. You remember Friday? You said you knew her because you did odd jobs for her. You painted her house. You cut her new lawn. You took your child over to her house and her, her children and your child played on the trampoline while you were doing the work. And now, all of a sudden, she's a pill. Huh. Your house from Friday to Monday, he got a new perspective on her. Maybe because they don't have the evidence they need, so throw some at her. She told you why she put that gun outside. I, I'm still baffled today by Riddle's response to her in the room. Ma'am, I know your daughter's dead, but you have many more children. You need to be thinking about that. She has two children, one's an adult, and the other is Gabby. That's it. Destiny is gone. Gavin is the only one who's there. Gavin, as they are telling you here today, throughout this trial, shot his sister, mortally wounding her by accident. This is a woman who has her own mental health struggles because of trauma she has suffered. And she's thinking about that boy what's going to happen to him. He's going to spend the rest of her, his life knowing that he's the one who killed his sister. She does not want that. So she tells them it was some unknown man. Now, did the police start a, a dragnet for some unknown man? No. They couldn't. She puts the gun outside she says for two reasons. One is because she wants it out of the house. It's just been fired in the house, and it's resulted in the death of her daughter. Her son is still in the house. She puts the gun outside. She put it outside because she's also worried the police are going to blame her for <coughs> some kind of uh, for possessing the weapon. She doesn't have a felony, they told her. You don't have a felony, you possess the weapon. They say, we're not going to, we wouldn't have gone after Gavin. What do you think? We'd, we'd arrest a two-year-old? Well, I'd say if you're in an interview room with a woman who tells you multiple times that she has PTSD as a result of the rape, and her daughter has just been killed, and you jump up and down and yell and scream and pound the table and cuss her and tell her she ain't got a heart and a soul, I don't know exactly what's on your list of things. It's pretty short, I'm assuming. And I am absolutely shocked. And I hope they don't get up here again, because I'm not going to get a chance to talk to you again. They go, they can't figure out whether you remember best what you heard first or last. So they get both to the state. So they're going to get able to get back up after I sit down and talk and, and rebut what I told you. I don't get to do that. I'm just asking you to think in the back of your mind what Mr. Randall said about that. Because it's very simple, I believe, ladies and gentlemen. This was not a planned act. It happened. You don't believe that Ms. Howington was traumatized by the fact that her two and a half year old son shot her five year old daughter. I can't tell you. And then. Two hours of the shooting, she's sitting in a KBD interview. Part of the time she's at the house, part of the time she's being transport hospital, part of the time she's sitting there. <laughs> if that's not the most traumatic event you can you can imagine, nah, I can't think of anything else. But that's the person they were talking to. Did they treat her at all like a victim in any way? No, in fact, yesterday, they questioned whether or not she had been raped. Isn't it true, ma'am, that he was actually only charged with making false reports to the TBI? 
two female prosecutors. Just finish up your argument. Can you talk about the parties to the lawsuit, not the lawyers, Mr. Wagner? Minimizing the violence perpetrated upon Ms. Howard by the individual named by the sheriff of Sullivan County to oversee this program. And then to suggest that because someone else made a decision in Sullivan County to cut some kind of deal that she must be lying to you about having been raped. Most rape victims don't want to talk about being raped. Certainly not in a room with two other police officers who are yelling and screaming at them. Or coming into a courtroom and having to say it and talk about it. Don't be mistaken. That's what started the PTSD. That's why she was being treated. That's why she had medications for PTSD. No matter what anyone else says. And if I'm not mistaken, what I said in the closing argument a minute ago was after Mr. Wardlaw threw Mr. Oliver off the bus, she said, Ms. McGovern said, all Ms. Howington had to do was say no. Short memory. PTSD will do that to you too. I asked Mr. Wardlaw, remember what she said after you asked her, was it possible that Anton would have killed her? I'll show it to you. Play the video. Let me see it. Here's the transcript. You said, is it possible that Anton would do it? What was her response? No. I promise you he didn't do it. It wasn't him. She said no. They wouldn't accept no. But once she got around to saying, okay, you're right. You're right, Ms. Wardlaw. I can't do this anymore. You're right. What happens then? She's now the queen of the ball. They're going to try to get her in a hotel, get Gavin there for protection. They're going to look out for her and make sure she's safe. That's what you do with investigative techniques. You're training people to give you the answers you want. They've got the wrong answer. Now they want to blame it on her. She said, I can't take it. I can't do it anymore. You're right. And the abuse stops. There's a pretty good thing to look forward to. I'll tell you what you want us, what you say is true. You stop screaming at me. Triggering that PST, PSTD, making me think I'm crazy. Because you're telling me everything I know isn't true. That's a hell of a place to be. So she told him somebody else did it. She told him she said that to protect him. And the other steps that she took after that, telling him, agreeing with him, oh, it was Mr. Gap, you're right, Mr. Olive did it. It gets up, still gets it all Gap. You're being told, oh, she's trying to self-preservation. She's not charged with having shot the child. Gavin is the one who shot the child. Does it not make sense that she would try to protect Gavin? The only child, despite Mr. Little's math, that she has left, that she doesn't want to have to suffer mental illness for the rest of his life because he shot his sister? Is that not a reasonable goal for a mama bear to take? Everything after that just builds on that. How are you going to get, other than that is to say, Gavin did it. And they start saying, that's not true, this is not true. And finally she gets to it and says, Gavin did it. And when you look, well, you don't have the mannequin anymore. They have a mannequin on the side. That's when you shot just off the top of that couch. Off the cushions of the couch, the seating of the couch. Not a 
two foot height from the floor. Not where Gavin would be if he was pointing a gun. They kept telling her, that's not true. You would have to be on top of her, shooting like this. Down into her, that, that things are going through the couch and into the floor. <coughs> and it was a couch cushion right behind her when she was lying on her side. They had all the evidence they needed to know that this was an accident that she was not responsible for. But because they couldn't give her what they would give each other, which is 48 to 72 hours, to figure out what's going on, and we hope they are not suffering from PTSD and medicated, like she was, they had given her that 48 to 72 hours, they would have had time to know what happened. They would have had time to collect all that evidence at the scene and found the bullet in the cushion and stop telling her lies about where it should be and why it isn't there, and that must mean you did it. Because it's not adding up. It's not adding up because you don't know what the numbers are. You haven't done the investigation. You just drug this woman into a room and screamed at her for four hours and tell her all the things that you want it to be. It's clearly domestic. We knew that all along. We knew that. Thank you for telling us that's what we needed you to do. Now we're going to help you. She didn't change her story, they changed her story. She testified yesterday and she told you. And she told Wardlaw. They kept telling me I could, he couldn't have got on the steps. He could have got on the stool, he could have got, couldn't have got the top of that closet. It couldn't happen, it's not physically possible. And why? What did she answer to warn off? He either climbed up on, on the stool, or the gun wasn't where I put it. He either climbed up there, or the gun wasn't where I put it. I suggest to you that what the state has proven to you four days of testimony is that this was a horrible family tragedy. And that's where it should stay. They're not claiming that she killed this child. <coughs> but they're charged with murder. Because maybe Gavin got his hand on the gun because it was placed in the wrong place by somebody else elevates this to a felony murder. Only the state could try to find a way to make a family tragedy worse. Don't join them. They have failed to prove that this was anything other than that. In four days of testimony and all the evidence and all the questions about whether or not truthful statements were made doesn't change what happened. Ten minutes to nine on September 14th, 2019. It doesn't change what happened at that moment. It's just a justification to make it more and more the same. the possibility of an accident. Even though now they're telling you that, that nobody's telling you Gavin intended to shoot. It's not the destiny either. But it's just a horrible accident. Let it stay there. Please return to not get to it. Thank you. All right, thank you. State gets the final word. General Good, you were recognized for your final argument. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk a little bit about some of these numbers that Mr. Whalen just threw out, okay? So we know from the time that Ms. Howington gets home from the park with her two kids, from the time 911 calls, just like Mr. Whalen said, it's about 11 minutes. 
And because of that surveillance video from the neighbor, we know what she was doing for a good, good amount of that time. So for one of those 11 minutes, she's either getting paid for window tinting or what we would submit to you is more likely a drug transaction. If you believe her statement that she came in for the very first time yesterday and sat on that stand, three of those minutes, she was outside smoking, moving her car. And again, if you, if you take her at her word for what she said on this stand yesterday, four of those minutes, she waited to call 911 after seeing her child shot in the chest. Those were her words. Because she said that she walked up to that door, that glass door, she saw a flash of light, and she saw Gavin with the gun in his hand. And it is not until four minutes later that she places that call to 911. Let's talk about this 48 to 72 hours that the police have given her after she finds out that her daughter has been killed. Ladies and gentlemen, they gave her an hour, and what did she do? She hid the murder weapon, and she trashed her phone. Imagine what she could have done with 48 to 72 hours. That's why she didn't get additional time. It wasn't because the police were out there trying to, to investigate this murder, and it had to be a murder, it had to be a murder. That's not what this was at all. The person that put murder in the police officer's mind was this defendant. She called 911 and said that somebody broke into her home and shot her five-year-old daughter while she was laying on the couch in cold blood. Nobody put that in her head other than herself. This was the plan that she was concocting in those four minutes that she waited to call 911. And I want you to think about another thing. Mr. Whalen, you talked about the fact that, that Destiny probably died between... 15 to 30 seconds based on what the medical examiner testified to. Go back and listen to that 911 call. When she gets back in the house after hiding the gun, as her daughter is probably taking what will be her last breaths alone because she is outside hiding her gun, think about what she says on that 911 call. She says she's still breathing. <coughs> but again, Ms. Allington's not in there rendering aid. She can't be, based on her own statements. Think about what she said yesterday on the stand. While well, I was praying for her and saying her name. Also while hiding the gun. Her daughter took her very last breaths while her mother was outside throwing the gun in the bush. Sorry, that, that, is, that is evidence not in the record. This same instruction you will consider, ladies and gentlemen, what evidence is in the record and what is not. Final argument. I also want to talk about the fact that Ms. Howington was apparently too distraught to talk to police after learning of her daughter's death. Okay? The defense keeps saying that she has PTSD, that there's no way she wasn't in her right mind, right? So there's no way that anything that she said to these investigators after finding out that her daughter had died was, was accurate. And that's why she was kind of all over the place. Ladies and gentlemen, she had no problem, none whatsoever, being very clear in these text messages to both Callie and to Mr. Keyes. She was very clear in these messages about the events. She had no problem telling them exactly where to go to her house and find that gun that she had just hit. She wasn't confused about that at all, was she? But, but you're supposed to believe that, that hours later she's too distraught to give an accurate story about how her daughter died? She's too distraught to even remember who all was in her home? Is that what you're supposed to believe? She can tell these people exactly where the gun is that she hid. She knows to go in a bathroom at UT Medical Center while her daughter's life lays in the balance and destroy her phone or try and give it away. She knows to do all that, so but she, she can't possibly. She could have taken her last breath through the house and still be in her life in the balance at the hospital. Right, this is final <coughs> argument. You will judge what facts are within this record and what are not, ladies and gentlemen. Continue with your argument. Again, she's too distraught to, to give accurate facts about what happened in the shooting, so she's not too distraught to do all these things to try and cover herself up, right? That's what you're, that's what you're supposed to believe. 
You, you're supposed to believe that she was protecting Gavin. That's why she did everything that she did. That's why she framed Destiny's father for murder, ladies and gentlemen. She did. Think about what she said up on that stand yesterday when I said that to her. I said, Miss Harrington, you do realize that your statements alone could have caused Destiny's father to be arrested for first-degree murder. Her response to me verbatim was, Antoine didn't matter. Antoine had nothing to do with this case. But she, she had no problem framing him for murder, as long as it didn't look like she did anything wrong. That's all this has ever been about, ladies and gentlemen. And again, you'll, you have those videos. You get to go back in that deliberation room and you can watch them as many times as you want. You find a place in there where she tells the investigators that she hid that gun to protect her son. Because I assure you, it's not in there. What she says is, I was scared I would get in trouble. I didn't want to be arrested for having a gun. Her. Not little two-year-old Gavin. Her. That is the only person that this defendant has ever been worried about throughout the pendency, the five years that this case has been pending, she is only worried about herself. That is clear from the evidence in this case. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, there are some things that, that we, neither side is ever going to agree on, but the one thing that I will agree on is, yes, we are not standing up here in front of you and saying that Robin Howington took her gun and shot her daughter in cold blood, because we can't say that, okay? There are three people that know what happened in that house on September the 14th, 2019. One of them is five-year-old Destiny. We all know that she can't come into this courtroom and tell you what happened to her. The other one was two years old at the time. And because he was two years old, when they tried to talk to him, what did he do? Rolled around the floor, drew a waterfall, drew a dog. He couldn't tell you what happened. He can't come in here in this courtroom and defend himself against his mother's allegations because he was two years old. The third person that knows exactly what happened in that house that night is that woman sitting right over there. And instead of being honest, instead of being truthful, when it came to who took the life of her five-year-old child, she took every single opportunity in the world to lie and lie and lie. Judge, I, I hate to object, but she's, she can't say that Gavin can't con come into the courtroom and defend himself against the accusation. That's it's, their theory. It's final argument. It's final argument. Again. The only person who can really tell us what happened is that woman over there, and she has done nothing but lies since this thing started. Even up until she took that stand yesterday, that was the very first time that she has ever told that version of events. Very first time. Five years this case has been pending. That's the first time when she took that stand in front of you all. That's the first time you've ever heard this version. She has played the victim in this whole thing. She has. She has been more worried about herself than anything else. That is evident. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I will not stand up here and tell you that there is a right way to react whenever you lose your child. Because every single person is going to react differently. But what I will say is that there's a wrong way to do it. <laughs> exactly what she did. You don't see your child get shot and immediately think to hide the weapon that killed her. That is not reasonable, ladies and gentlemen. That is not what happens in accidents. If she was truly trying to protect Gavin, why have other people try and come and get this gun? Why? There is no reason for that. There's absolutely no logical explanation, no reasonable explanation for her actions from September 14th of 2019 till she took that stand yesterday. There's no, there's, there's just nothing she can do to explain that away. No matter how many stories she tells, that does not add up. So yeah, I, I will agree with Mr. Whalen. There's not a right way to act whenever you lose a child. But there is 
a completely wrong way. And it's everything that she did. Again, I, I go back to, we keep hearing that she was too distraught to, to be talked to during that time. If she would have been a little bit more honest and upfront, she probably wouldn't have been in that room for four, four hours. If she wouldn't have changed her story every 10 minutes, every time she was confronted with a new piece of evidence, she wouldn't have had to be in that room for four hours. If she wouldn't have lied and said that she saw her son take the, a bar stool, put it up to her closet, she wouldn't have had to go back to her house so that they could measure that. She brought all of the investigator's actions upon herself, and we want to keep talking about how Investigator Riddle yelled at her. He was frustrated, ladies and gentlemen, again, based on the information that she has given them. They think that there is su a, a suspect at large out there shooting five-year-olds. How frustrating must that be? I'll tell you how frustrating it is. Investigator Riddle was frustrated. He admitted that on the stand. There is nothing wrong with the way he acted based on her actions of, of destroying her phone in the hospital while her daughter is being tended to. She's more worried about destroying her phone? Of course he's frustrated. That's what makes him a good investigator. And then we want to talk about how Investigator Wardlaw hugged the defendant. Well, the, the defense can't have it both ways. Okay, they can't say that, that the officers are overbearing and intimidating and then in the same breath fault them for trying to console her when she's crying. They can't have it both ways, ladies and gentlemen. The defense wants to focus on what these officers did instead of looking at the evidence against Miss Howington. <coughs> these officers were doing their job and they had to do extra work because of what she did, not because of anything that they did. Miss Howington had to know that the gun was, was in an unsafe place. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not what neglect is, okay? That is not what, what we have to show. But I would submit to you that, based on her own statements, she absolutely should have known that that gun was in an unsafe place. If we want to take Miss Howington at her word, that she, she took this stand, she raised her hand, she, she took an oath to tell the truth. Maybe she did this time. So let's just assume she did. Even if we take every single word that she said yesterday as true. That is the definition of neglect. Think about it. Callie supposedly gets this gun, puts it back together, and she says, okay, go put it up. She doesn't ask him where he put it. She doesn't check to make sure he put it in a safe place. She just doesn't care. Goes about her business for two days. She is responsible for her own children in her own home. If she wants to take on having a gun in her home where her two children are, it is her responsibility and nobody else's. It is not Callie's, it is not anyone's. It is her gun in her home with her kids. Nobody else's. And she admitted that. She admitted that to Investigator Wardlaw the night of the shooting. He said, don't you think that it's your responsibility to make sure that your gun is kept in a safe place? Yes. She agreed then. It is her responsibility, ladies and gentlemen. She had a duty to her two small children to make sure that they were protected, to make sure that they were safe. And she failed miserably. In the three minutes that she now claims she was outside smoking, she says that this two-year-old got this gun that she apparently has no idea where it is in her house. <coughs> Y'all saw the pictures of little Gavin. He's not 
not very tall, it had to be somewhere pretty accessible. She didn't testify that when she walked in that there were stools pushed everywhere for him climbing this time. No, this time she, she didn't say that. She agreed with me that it's pretty it had to be pretty accessible to him. Three minutes. That's all it took. She was outside smoking, according to her own statement. And her five-year-old daughter lost her life. And that's on her, ladies and gentlemen. That's not on Gavin. That's on their mother, Robin Hamilton. That's why she's on trial today. Not because the state or the investigators want to turn an accident into a murder. It's not why we're here, ladies and gentlemen. We are here because of one person's actions and one person only. It's that woman sitting right there at that table. This is a tragedy. A five-year-old girl lost her life. It, it, it is. It is, a, it is an absolute tragedy. I will not stand up here before you and say that it is not. But it could have been prevented. It should have been prevented. By the one person who had the, the duty and the responsibility to do so. And like I said, failed miserably at it. For all those reasons, ladies and gentlemen, we ask that you deliver a verdict that comports with the evidence in this case. And the only verdict that supports the evidence is guilty as charged. Thank you all very much for your time. All right, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the instructions in this case are 22 pages long, and I believe I can read those to you in roughly 20 minutes or so. Uh, but I'm going to give you the option. It's uh, right at noon. The food will be here about 1230. Would you like for me to go ahead and read the instructions, or does anyone need a break before we do that? Okay. All right. If you would pass out, the bailiffs are going to pass out copies of the court's instructions on the law. Uh, you are receiving these copies so that you will have a copy to read along with me as I read the instructions to you. When uh, the court has concluded reading the instructions and as you're leaving the courtroom, please stack your copy up on the witness stand. Uh, uh, Officer Morgan will help you do that. I need only the original, which bears my signature, to go back in the jury room with you uh, to assist your foreperson in deliberations. So let me know when everybody's got one. All right, let's read along together. The evidence and argument in this case have been completed, and I will now instruct you as the law of the law applicable this case is stated in these instructions, and it is your duty to consider all of them. The order in which these instructions are given is no indication of their relative importance. You should not single out one or more of them to the exclusion of others, but should consider each one in the light of and in harmony with the others. The indictment is the formal written accusation charging the defendant with a crime. It is not evidence against the defendant, it does not create any inference of guilt. The defendant, Robin Rebecca Howington, is charged in indictment number 117659 with the offense of first-degree felony murder as alleged in count one, aggravated child neglect as alleged in counts two and three, false report as alleged in count four, tampering with evidence as alleged in count five, and attempted tampering with evidence as alleged in count six. To these offenses, she has entered a plea of not guilty. There are a total of six counts for you to consider, and the essential elements are as follows. First count. Any person who commits first-degree felony murder is guilty of a crime. If you define the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must have proven beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following essential elements. One, that the defendant or one for whom the defendant is criminally responsible and lawfully killed Destiny Oliver. And two, that the killing was committed in the perpetration of or the attempt to perpetrate the crime of aggravated child neglect. That is, that the killing was closely connected to the alleged crime of aggravated child neglect and was not a separate, distinct, and independent event. And three, that the defendant intended to commit the alleged crime of aggravated child neglect. The elements of an aggravated child neglect are defined in counts two and three of these instructions. The intent to commit the underlying felony must exist prior to or concurrent with the commission of the act causing the death of the victim. Proof that such intent to commit the underlying felony existed before or concurrent with the, the act of killing is a question of fact to be decided by the jury after consideration of all the facts and circumstances. Consideration of such factors as time, place, and causation is helpful in determining whether, whether a killing was committed in the perpetration of the alleged crime of aggravated child neglect. The killing may precede, coincide with, or follow the aggravated child neglect and still be considered as occurring in the perpetration of the aggravated child neglect so long as there is a connection in time, place, and continuity of action. 
If you find the defendant not guilty, if you have a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt of first-degree felony murder, you will next consider the defendant's guilt or innocence of reckless homicide, a lesser-included offense of the first count. Any person who commits reckless homicide is guilty of a crime. If you find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must have proven beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following essential elements. One, that the defendant or one for whom the defendant is criminally responsible killed Destiny Oliver, and two, that the defendant acted recklessly. If you find the defendant not guilty, if you have a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt of reckless homicide, you will next consider the defendant's guilt or innocence of criminally negligent homicide, a lesser-included offense of the first count. Any person who commits criminally negligent homicide is guilty of a crime. If you find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must have proven beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following essential elements. One, that the defendant's conduct resulted in the death of Destiny Oliver, and two, that the defendant acted with criminal negligence. Count two. Any person who commits the offense of aggravated child neglect is guilty of a crime. If you find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must have proven beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following essential elements. One, that the defendant knowingly neglected a child to at Destiny Oliver so as to adversely affect the child's health and welfare, and two, that the act of neglect resulted in serious bodily injury to the child, and three, that the child was eight years of age or less. Count three. Any person who commits the offense of aggravated child neglect is guilty of a crime. If you find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must have proven beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following essential elements. One, that the defendant knowingly neglected a child to at Destiny Oliver so as to adversely affect the child's health and welfare, and two, that a deadly weapon was used to accomplish the act, and three, that the child was eight years of age or less. Count four. Any person who initiates a false report or statement to a law enforcement officer is guilty of a crime. If you find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must have proven beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following essential elements. One, that the defendant initiated a report or statement to a law enforcement officer concerning an offense or incident within the officer's concern. To wit, her report to Detective Tim Riddle that an unknown male shot her daughter. And two, that the defendant knew the information relating to the offense reported was false. Count five. Any person who tampers with evidence is guilty of a crime. If you find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must have proven beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following essential elements. One, that the defendant knew an investigation was pending and was in progress, and two, that the defendant concealed a firearm with the intent to impair its availability as evidence in the investigation. If you find the defendant not guilty, if you have a reasonable doubt, as to the defendant's guilt of tampering with evidence, you will next consider the defendant's guilt or innocence of a criminal attempt, a lesser-included offense of the fifth count. Any person who commits the offense of criminal attempt is guilty of a crime. If you find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must have proven beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following essential elements. One, that the defendant intended to commit the offense of tampering with evidence, and two, that the defendant did some act intending to complete a course of action or cause a result that would constitute tampering with evidence under the circumstances as the defendant believed them to be at the time, and her actions constitute a substantial step toward the commission of tampering with evidence. The defendant's actions do not constitute a substantial step unless the defendant's entire course of action clearly shows her intent to commit tampering with evidence. Count six. Any person who commits the offense of criminal attempt is guilty of a crime. If you find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must have proven beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following essential elements. One, that the defendant intended to commit the offense of tampering with evidence. And two, that the defendant did some act intending to complete a course of action or cause a result that would constitute tampering with evidence under the circumstances as the defendant believed them to be at the time, and her actions constitute a substantial step toward the commission of tampering with evidence. The defendant's actions do not constitute a substantial step unless the defendant's entire course of action clearly shows her intent to commit tampering with evidence. The elements of tampering with evidence are set forth as follows. One, that the defendant knew an investigation was pending and was in progress. And two, that the defendant altered a thing to wit a cellular phone with the intent to impair its availability as evidence in the investigation. In reaching your verdict, you shall first consider the offense charge in numbered counts one through six of indictment number 117659. If you unanimously find the defendant guilty of that indicted offense beyond a reasonable doubt, you shall return a verdict of guilty for that offense. If you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of that offense or have a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt of that offense, you shall then proceed to consider whether or not the defendant is guilty of the next lesser included offense in order from greatest to least within that count. You shall not proceed to consider any lesser included offense until you have first made a unanimous determination that the defendant is not guilty of the immediately preceding greater offense or you unanimously have a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt of that offense. If you have a reasonable doubt of the guilt of the defendant as to all offenses charged included in that count, you shall return a verdict of not guilty and proceed to the next count. Adversely affect the child's health and welfare may include but not be limited to the natural effects of starvation or dehydration. Child means a person under 18 years of age. Injury includes a cut, abrasion, bruise, burn, or disfigurement, physical pain or temporary illness or impairment of the function of a body member, organ, or mental faculty. Serious bodily injury means bodily injury that involves a substantial risk of death 
protracted unconsciousness, extreme physical pain, protracted or obvious disfigurement, or protracted loss or substantial impairment of the function of a bodily member, organ, or mental faculty, or broken bone of a child who is eight years of age or less. Serious bodily injury to the child includes, but is not limited to, second or third degree burns, a fracture of any bone, a concussion, subdural or sub, uh, cranial bleeding, retinal hemorrhage, uh, cerebral edema, brain contusion, injuries to the skin that involves severe bruising, or the likelihood of permanent or protracted disfigurement, including, including those sustained by whipping children with objects. Recklessly means that a person acts recklessly when the person is aware of but constantly disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the, the alleged victim will be killed. The risk must be of such a nature and degree that its disregard constitutes a gross deviation from the standard of care that an ordinary person would exercise under all the circumstances as viewed from the accused person's standpoint. The requirement of recklessly is also established if it is shown that the defendant acted knowingly or intentionally. Knowingly means that a person acts knowingly with respect to the conduct or to circumstances surrounding the conduct when the person is aware of the nature of the conduct or that the circumstances exist. A person acts knowingly with respect to a result of the person's conduct when the person is aware that the conduct is reasonably certain to cause the result. The requirement of knowingly is also established if it is shown that the defendant acted intentionally. Intentionally means that a person acts intentionally with respect to the nature of the conduct or to the result of the conduct when it is the person's conscious objective or desire to engage in the conduct or cause the result. Criminal negligence means that a person acts with criminal negligence when the person ought to be aware of a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the alleged victim will be killed. The risk must be of such a nature and degree that the failure to perceive it constitutes a gross deviation from the standard of care that an ordinary person would exercise under all the circumstances as viewed from the accused person's standpoint. The requirement of criminal negligence is also established if it is shown that the defendant acted intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly. Bodily injury includes a cut, abrasion, bruise, burn, or disfigurement, and physical pain or temporary illness or impairment of the function of a bodily member, organ, or mental faculty. Law enforcement officer means an officer, employee, or agent of government who has a duty imposed by law to A, maintain public order, or B, make arrests for offenses, whether that duty extends to all offenses or is limited to specific offenses, and C, investigate, should say, or C, or investigate the commission or suspected commission of offenses. During the trial, you heard the expert testimony of Dr. Amy Halls, MD, who was described to us as an expert in the field of forensic pathology, Kyle Osborne, formerly of the TBI, who was described to us as an expert in the field of microanalysis and gunshot powder residue, Lad Kuykendall, TBI, who was described to us as an expert in the field of firearm and tool mark identification, and Terry Pate, KPD, who was described to us as an expert in the field of narcotics investigation. The rules of evidence provide that if scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge might assist the jury in understanding the evidence or in determining a fact and issue, a witness qualified as an expert by reason of special knowledge, skill, or experience may testify and state his opinions concerning such matters and give reasons for his testimony. Merely because an expert witness has expressed an opinion does not mean, however, that you are bound to accept this opinion. The same as with any other witness, it is up to you to decide whether you believe this testimony and choose to rely upon it. Part of that decision will depend on your judgment about whether the witness's background or training and experience is sufficient for the witness to give the expert opinion that you heard. You must uh, also decide whether the witness's opinions were based on sound reasons, judgment, and information. You are to give the testimony of an expert witness such weight and value as you think it deserves along with all the other evidence in the case. Any attempt by a person to conceal or destroy evidence is a circumstance which, when considered with all the facts of the case, may justify an inference of guilt. While that inference is by no means strong enough to, uh, of itself to warrant conviction, yet it may become one of a series of circumstances from which guilt may logically be, uh, be logically inferred. Whether the evidence presented pr proves beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant so acted is a question for your determination. If this fact is proven, this fact alone does not allow you to find that the defendant is guilty of the <coughs> crime alleged. However, since an attempt by a defendant to destroy or conceal evidence might be may be caused by a consciousness of guilt, you may consider this fact, if it is so proven, together with all the other evidence when you decide the guilt or innocence of the defendant. On the other hand, a person in, entirely innocent of a particular crime may attempt to destroy or conceal evidence, and this may be explained by proof offered by facts and circumstances, by the facts and circumstances of the case. Whether there was any attempt to destroy or conceal evidence by the defendant, the reasons for it, and the weight to be given to it are questions for you to determine. Evidence has been introduced in this trial of a statement or statements by the defendant made outside the trial to show an admission against interest. An admission against interest is a statement by the defendant which acknowledges the existence of truth or truth of some fact necessary to be proven to establish the guilt of the defendant or which tends to show guilt of the defendant or is evidence of some material fact but not amounting to a confession. While this evidence has been received, it remains your duty to decide if in fact such a, a such statement was ever made. 
If you believe a statement was not made by the defendant, you should not consider it. If you decide the statement was made by the defendant, you must judge the truth of the facts stated. In so determining, consider the circumstances under which the statement was made. Also consider whether any of the other evidence before you tends to contradict the statement in whole or in part. You must not, however, arbitrarily disregard any part of any statement, but rather should consider all the, all, any statement you believe was made and is true. You are the sole judge of what weight should be given such statement. If you decide a statement was made, you should consider it with all the other evidence in the case in determining the defendant's guilt or innocence. At times during the trial, I have ruled upon the admissibility of evidence. You must not concern yourself with these rulings. Neither by these rulings, the instructions, nor by any other remark do I mean to indicate any opinion as to facts or as to what your verdict should be. The statements, arguments, and remarks of the attorneys are intended to help you in understanding and applying the law, but they are not evidence. You should disregard any statements made that you believe are not supported by the evidence. You are the exclusive judge of the facts in this case. Also, you are the exclusive judge of the law under the direction of the court. In applying the law of the facts and deciding this case, you should consider all the evidence in the light of your own observations and experience in life. The law presumes that the defendant is innocent of the charge against her. This presumption remains with the defendant throughout every stage of the trial, and it is not overcome unless from all the evidence in the case you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. The state has the burden of proving the guilt of the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt, and this burden never shifts but remains on the state throughout the trial of the case. The defendant is not required to prove her innocence. Reasonable doubt is that doubt created by an investigation of all the proof in the case and an inability after such investigation to let the mind rest easily as to the certainty of guilt. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based upon reason and common sense after careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence in this case. Absolute certainty of guilt is not demanded by the law to convict of any criminal charge, but moral certainty is required, and this certainty is required as to every element of proof necessary to constitute the offense. A reasonable doubt is just that, a doubt that is reasonable after an examination of all the facts of this case. If you find the state has not proven every element of the offense beyond a reasonable doubt, then you should find the defendant not guilty. The state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt all the elements of the crime charged, that the crime, if in fact committed, was committed by this defendant in Knox County, Tennessee, and that it was committed before the finding and returning of the indictment in this case. Some of you have taken notes during the trial. Once you retire the jury room, you may refer to your notes, but only to refresh your own memory of the witness's testimony. You are free to discuss the testimony of the witnesses with your fellow jurors, but each of you must rely upon your own individual memory as to what a witness did or did not say. You should not view your notes as authoritative records or consider them as a transcript of the testimony. Your notes should carry no more weight than the unrecorded recollection of another juror. It is your job to decide what the facts of this case are. You must decide which witnesses you believe and how important you think their testimony is. You do not have to accept or reject everything a witness said. You are free to believe all, none, or part of any person's testimony. In deciding which testimony you believe, you should rely on your own common sense and everyday experience. There is no fixed set of rules for judging whether you believe a witness, but it may help you to think about these questions. One, was the witness able to see or hear clearly? How long was the witness watching or listening? Was anything else going on that might have distracted the witness? Two, did the witness seem to have a good memory? Three, how did the witness look and act while testifying? Did the witness seem to be making an honest effort to tell the truth, or did the witness seem to evade the questions? Four, has there been any evidence presented regarding the witness's intelligence, respectability, or reputation for truthfulness? Five, does the witness have any bias, prejudice, or personal interest in how the case is decided? Six, have there been any promises, threats, suggestions, or other influences that affected how the witness testified? Seven, in general, does the witness have any special reason to tell the truth or any special reason to lie? All in all, how reasonable does the witness's testimony seem when you think about all the other evidence in the case? Sometimes the testimony of different witnesses will not agree, and you must decide which testimony you accept. You should think about whether the disagreement involves something important or not, and whether you think someone is lying or is simply mistaken. People see and hear things differently, and witnesses may testify honestly but simply be wrong about what they thought they saw or remembered. It is also a good idea to think about which testimony agrees best with the other evidence in the case. However, you may conclude that a witness deliberately lied about something that is important to how you decide the case. If so, you may choose not to accept anything that witness said. On the other hand, if you think the witness lied about some things but told the truth about others, you may simply accept the part you think is true and ignore the rest. A witness may be impeached by proving that he or she has made some material statements out of court which are at variance with his or her evidence on the witness stand. However, proof of such prior inconsistent statements may be considered by you only for the purpose of testing the witness's credibility and not as substantive evidence of the truth of the matter asserted in such out-of-court statements. Further, a witness may be impeached by a careful cross-examination involving the witness in contradictory, unreasonable, and improbable statements. However, immaterial discrepancies or differences in the statements of witnesses do not affect their credibility unless it should plainly appear that some witness has willfully testified falsely. When a witness is thus impeached, the jury has the right to disregard his or her evidence and treat it as untrue. 
except where it is corroborated by other credible testimony or by the facts and circumstances proved in the trial. The defendant having testified in her own behalf, her credibility is determined by the same rules by which the credibility of other witnesses is determined, and you will give her testimony such weight as you may think it is entitled. The guilt of the defendant, as well as any fact required to be proved, may be established by direct evidence, by circumstantial evidence, or by both combined. Direct evidence is those parts of the testimony admitted in court which referred to what happened and was testified to by witnesses who saw, heard, or otherwise sensed what happened firsthand. If witnesses testified about what they themselves saw, heard, or sensed the defendant do, they presented direct testimony about what the defendant did at the time they saw, heard, or otherwise sensed. Circumstantial evidence is all the testimony exhibits which give you clues about what happened in an indirect way. It consists of all the evidence that is not direct evidence. Do not assume that direct evidence is always better than circumstantial evidence. According to our laws, direct evidence is not necessarily better than circumstantial evidence. Either type of evidence can prove a fact if it is convincing enough. Thus, the important thing for you to keep in mind is whether a piece of evidence is convincing beyond a reasonable doubt, but not whether it is direct or circumstantial. The verdict must represent the considered judgment of each juror, and each juror must agree there, too. Your verdict must be unanimous. It is your duty as jurors to consult with one another and to deliberate with a view to reaching an agreement if you can do so without violence to your own individual judgment. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but do so only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with your fellow jurors. In the course of your deliberations, do not hesitate to reexamine your own views and change your opinion if convinced it is erroneous. But do not surrender your honest conviction as the weight or effect of the evidence solely because of the opinion of your fellow jurors or for the mere purpose of returning a verdict. You can have no prejudice or sympathy or allow anything but the law and the evidence to have any influence upon your verdict. You must render your verdict with absolute fairness and impartiality as you think justice and truth dictate. If you find that the state has proven the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, then you should find, I should say, her guilty. On the other hand, if you find the state has not proven beyond a reasonable doubt the defendant's guilt or if you have a reasonable doubt as to her guilt, then you must find her not guilty. When you retire the jury room, you will first select one of your members as four person who will preside over your deliberations. You will be provided with a form for all possible verdicts. In this case, the jury will complete the verdict form and your four person will sign the verdict form. When you have reached a verdict, you will return with it to this courtroom and your four person will deliver it to the court. The first alternate will be Mr. Dagman. You'll be the first alternate. I'll give you further instructions on what that means here in just a moment. Be excused and go. Mr. Whalen. Mr. Williams, thank you very much for being here with us today. You'll exit at the back door in a moment with the rest of the jurors. As long as your fellow jurors will not discuss the case, you all can eat lunch together. It should be here in just a few minutes, but it's critically important for the other 12 of you who will decide the case that you're only deliberating and discussing the case when it's just the 12 of you within the room. Does everybody understand that? For the other 12 of you, the case is now yours for deliberation. Mr. Dagman, the bailiffs will make you a place, a separate room where you're going to be. They'll do their very best to make you comfortable and separate apart from your fellow jurors in the event that one of your fellow jurors fell ill or could not continue to serve for whatever reason, you would replace that juror and deliberations would begin anew with you as a part of the panel. As stated a moment ago, for the other 12 of you, the case is now yours for deliberation. Select one of your members as foreperson and we will await your unanimous verdict. You may now discuss the case. If you would, as you exit the courtroom, please leave your copy of the instructions on the table. I'm getting ready to sign the original, which will go back with you. All rise for the jury. My plan is I'm going to take five minutes and call the docket and then we're going to break for lunch. We're not going to get anything done before then.
when this verdict was announced, I did not want to hear a sound in this courtroom. Does everyone understand that? All right, get the jury lined up. Was this their first week? I'm going to ask that nobody be on the front row right next to the jury, please. All rise for the jury. Everyone may have a seat. Wave the call for the state or the defense. If you could pass the verdict form up here, please, um, Mr. Morgan. Mr. March, I understand you are the poor person of this jury. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Understand the jury has reached a unanimous verdict as to each of the counts contained within this indictment. Is that correct? Yes, sir. If you would stand, please, sir. Ms. Allington, if you would stand and face the jury. Mr. Martz, as to the first count of this indictment charging uh, felony, uh, first degree felony murder, has the jury reached a unanimous verdict? Yes, we have, Your Honor. And that verdict is what, please? Uh, the jury, uh, we, the jury, find the defendant, Robin Rebecca Allington, guilty of reckless homicide. As to the second count, alleging aggravated child neglect, has the jury reached a unanimous verdict? Yes, sir. And that verdict is what, please? We, the jury, find the defendant, Rosalind Rebecca Howington, guilty of aggravated child neglect. As to the third count, alleging aggravated child neglect, has the jury reached a unanimous verdict? Yes, sir. And that verdict is what, please? We, the jury, find the defendant, Robin Rebecca Howington, guilty of aggravated child neglect. 
as to the fourth count alleging initiating or filing a false report to law enforcement has the jury reached a unanimous verdict? Yes, sir. And that verdict is what, please? We, the jury, find the defendant, Rodney Rebecca Howington, guilty of initiating a false report to a law enforcement officer. As to the fifth count alleging tampering with evidence, has the jury reached a unanimous verdict? Yes, sir. And that verdict is what, please? We, the jury, find the defendant, Rodney Rebecca Howington, guilty of tampering with evidence. And as to the sixth count alleging attempted tampering with evidence, has the jury reached a unanimous verdict? Yes, sir. And that verdict is what, please? We, the jury, find the defendant, Rodney Rebecca Howington, guilty of attempted tampering with evidence. If that is your verdict, if you would signify by raising your right hand, please. Let the record reflect all 12 hands are raised. Does either side wish for the court to poll this jury? All right, Ms. Howington, you may have a seat. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your hard work. You have concluded week one of your jury service. I wish I could tell you that you're done, but you're not. You've still got one more week of service. I know that we've got another case to start in here on Monday, so I'm sure I'm going to see a lot of you back on Monday morning when we're picking another jury. Have a very good weekend. Thank you very much for your service, and I'll see you on Monday. All rise for the jury. All right, everyone may have a seat. Ms. Howington, based upon the jury's verdict of guilt, finding you guilty in counts, count one of reckless homicide as well as counts two and three of aggravated child neglect, count four, filing a false police report, count five, tampering with evidence, and count six, attempted tampering with evidence. The court revokes your bond. You're ordered into custody. When do we need to set this for sentencing? What's 45 days? April 22nd. What day of the week is that? That preceding Friday would be what, the 19th? Does Friday, April the 19th work for everyone for sentencing? Yes, sir. Is that good, General? Ms. Howington, I will see you on April the 19th. The court will conduct a sentencing hearing at that time. In the interim, a pre-sentence investigation report will be prepared. Probation will be interviewing you if you wish to have your attorney present with you. When that interview is conducted, you have a right to do so. I'll see you on April the 19th. Thank you, Your Honor.